seven o'clock. Thank you all very much for coming. Recording in progress. I call this meeting of the Needham Planning Board uh, to order at uh, seven o'clock on July, on June 7, rather. Uh, this meeting is being conducted uh, in a hybrid manner, consistent with state uh, guidelines. Uh, anything that, uh, that you say uh, um, or share will be recorded and will become a matter of public record. Um, tonight on our agenda, we will have a public hearing at 7.20, and at that time, uh, we'll have an opportunity for the public to comment. Um, we have a number of other items on our agenda, so we'll begin with those. Um, and um, I, I, think that's, I think that's good to, to start. So the first item on our agenda is uh, approval of the minutes from our April 12 meeting. Um, does anybody have any comments from those minutes? Um, uh, yes, I, I just happened to notice as I reviewed, um, Adam, um, Jean McKnight speaking, I just happened to notice as I was reviewing the red line that I and myself created, I, I see an error on the second page uh, where uh, the word is, is needed. Um, it, it is the parking waiver now to be granted only sufficient. The word is is missing, is only sufficient. So Thank you. Um, that is uh, my fault for leaving that word out. And You're uh, forgiven. <laughs> I move that we accept the minutes of April 12th, 2022 as redlined uh, with the one change mentioned. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, we'll come to the vote. Um, uh, Paul Alpert? Aye. Artie Crocker? Aye. Gene McKnight? Aye. The chair votes aye, so we have a unanimous decision by all members present to approve the minutes of April 12. We now come to uh, the Heather Lane Definitive Subdivision and Heather Lane Extension Definitive Subdivision uh, residential compound special permit bond reduction. Uh, and to this, Lee, I see that we have um, letters from our town engineer uh, dated uh, June 6 and June 7. The June 6 letter relates to the Heather Lane extension and it shows a balance of 28,000. Uh, meanwhile, I believe from a letter of about a year ago, uh, I think the balance was 34,500. So I think there is a $6,500 difference if I, my math adds up. Is that correct? Yes, they're, re they're requesting a reduction um, on two subdivisions here. I think you started with the Heather Lane extension. So currently the town holds 34,500. Um, and the engineering department, based upon an inspection of the property, is recommending that that surety be re re reduced from 34500 to 27000 34500 to $27,000. Uh, can you state that again, that last part, please? Um, so on, on, on the first subdivision you took up was the Heather Lane extension, which is the residential compound at the, at the end of Heather Lane. Um, so the town currently holds for the surety on the street construction, 34,500. Um, and engineering is now recommending that we hold $27,000. I have 28 as of his letter from June 6. Okay, then I misspoke. I thought it was. I apologize. Yes, you're correct. Yes, with, with the 2% inflation, it's 28. So he's recommending that it go from 34,500 to 28,000. You're okay. correct. Okay, and then uh, as relates to the uh, Heather Lane definitive subdivision, um, there was an original amount of 120. As relates 
to 122,500, and it looks as though uh, our town engineer is looking to withhold 95. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. So do the board members have any comments about reducing the bond accordingly? So I move um, that with regard to the bond that's being held for um, the Heather Lane definitive subdivision, uh, we approve the reduction of the bond from 122500 down to 95000 And with regard to the bond being held for the Heather Lane extension definitive subdivision, we reduce the bond from 34500 down to 28,000 and refund the difference. We have a motion, do I have a second? Second. We have a motion by Paul Alpert, a second by uh, Artie Crocker. Uh, to any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, we'll come to the vote. Uh, uh, Paul Alpert? Aye. Artie Crocker? Aye. Jean McKnight? Aye. The chair votes aye, uh, unanimously decided by the members present to approve the reduction accordingly. The next item on our agenda is the Board of Appeals. They're meeting for June uh, 16, which has three items on their agenda. One is uh, 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 a revision to um, an existing special permit for a property at 68 Wilshire Park. The second is for an adult daycare at 35 Highland Circle. And the uh, third matter is a continuation with uh, respect to uh, Temple Best Shalom at, 60, at 670 Highland Avenue, 284 Webster Street, and 28 Greendale Avenue, uh, which was a continued hearing from, uh, from last month. Uh, does anybody have any comments on any of the three? Although, Paul, I understand you're recused from the third matter. Well, uh, yes, and um, usually when we've already commented on, on the matter, here. right? we don't bother discussing it. Very good. On a continuation. So no. does anybody else have any comment on the first two items? I have no comment. No. I have no comment. So, uh, Mr. Chair, Actually, I, before, I before we have the motion, I did actually have one comment. Go for it. Um, with respect to Lee, the, the property at 35 Highland Circle, there was, um, they note in a, they have common space for um, activity in a social room, which is a large area kind of in the middle of their floor plan. And yet they have another area that's designated as a quote, activity and social room, which is a little over eight feet by 17 feet, a total of roughly 144 square feet. And my question was whether or not, if that's gonna be an adult daycare typically used for seniors, I'm not sure if that's enough space for clients and staff, particularly in the age of COVID. In other words, it seems like a smaller room, almost the size of a bedroom. Uh, so I don't know if that's something that the uh, that the floor plan in particular to that one room, is that something that the Board of Appeals typically reviews? Well, they're gonna, re I think, review the operational, you know, parameters of the use. And I think if they have a, a, any concern with the amount of square footage that's dedicated for a particular use, I'm sure that they'll address it. Okay, so then should we vote no comment or should we make that a comment? I'm, I move that we vote no comment. Okay. On both cases. So we have a motion to approve, uh, we have a motion f to make no comment on uh, uh, 68 Wilshire Park and 35 Highland Circle. Do I have a second? I second. Second by Jean McKnight. Any discussion? Hearing none, I come to the vote. Uh, uh, Paul Alpert? Aye. Hardy Crocker? Aye. Jean McKnight? Aye. The chair votes aye. Uh, we have unanimously uh, decided no comment with respect to the ZBA agenda items. Thank you. Uh, we're actually running a couple minutes early, which is very good. Um, Lee, is there something that you would like us to consider in the intervening six minutes? Um, I would like to 
Um, Jean, um, do you want to give them an update on the work of the housing working group at this point and what we have planned for our meeting on uh, Thursday of this week? Um, yes. Um, the housing plan working group has three subgroups. Um, I and uh, Oscar Meritz and uh, recently Heidi Frail and Ed Scheidler was uh, included, but he uh, decided he didn't have time for the subgroup. That is the zoning subgroup. And we've been working very hard on understanding the MBTA Communities Act and the guidelines that I know are still in draft form put out by DHCD and considering um, what steps the town could take uh, to comply with the requirements of that law and uh, guidelines and um, considering other uh, zoning amendments that um, we'd like to put out for discussion and that presentation will be made by Oscar Meritz um, on Thursday evening. Uh, then the other, um, there is a, a subgroup um, that is uh, concerned with, with preservation. Um, and I can't um, just recite the names of the persons on each subgroup other than the one I serve on. Um, but that will be making, and there are persons on, uh, um, you know, concerned about historic preservation, concerned about the preservation of our small homes in Needham, and making, uh, likely to make recommendations um, relating to those subjects. Um, and then um, the third is capacity building. Um, you know, whenever uh, any new project is proposed, whether it's residential or, as we have before us tonight, um, a business development, um, there's a concern about what the capacity of the town is, uh, whether it's roads, schools, water, sewer, and that committee will be making its report on any issues that we may have in that regard. When do you, uh, do you have a, a date or when you anticipate that capacity report? Uh, that, that would be, all three of the reports will be orally given on this coming Thursday evening, I believe our meeting is at 7 p.m. And um, it, it is a Zoom meeting, if I'm not mistaken. Um, that's right, isn't it, um, Alice? Yes, yes, yes please. 7.15 by Zoom. Now, um, we're starting also uh, the meeting tomorrow with a report by Reg Foster, the chair of the Housing Authority. Uh, who will bring us up to date on um, the proposal for renovation, redevelopment of the public housing developments in our town. And, you know, the, the funding that recently was approved by town meeting out of the Community Preservation Act, uh, the funding that they're seeking from state and federal agencies, and what their ideas are for these improvements that are very, everybody acknowledges are very much needed. That's so that's our agenda. This is a very important meeting. Where we're, in a sense, wrapping up the work of many months. And will you also prepare a written report in addition to the oral? I expect each um, um, subgroup will have a written report. Um, ours is still being pulled together, and I'm, I'm not sure we'll have a report, written report ahead of the meeting. Um, but there will be a um, you know, presentation uh, followed by a written report. Excellent. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Mm -hmm. Lee, do you have anything to add about the um, uh, housing working group? Uh, no, I would just say that the meeting after that, we're hoping to be able to look at, we're hoping that the DHC guidelines will be out um, and so that the community, so the committee can be looking at those DHC guidelines and what Needham's, you know, appropriate, what might be Needham's appropriate strategy um, to be responsive to those guidelines. And that's going to be discussed, I think, at the meeting in July. Um, and then we're hoping over the summer, based upon the input uh, from the work that's planned for next Thursday and the work that's planned around the draft guidelines from, MBT, from the MBTA communities, to begin to put together um, a draft plan which would articulate um, some goals and objectives. Good. Thank you very much. That's helpful. Um, Looking at the time, we are 7.19 with a hearing at 7.20. Do you uh, have 
uh, anything else in the next minute? No. All right, so we will, I guess, let the cameras roll for a minute, and then I'll call the hearing to order at 7.20. Unless any of my colleagues have anything they'd like to mention at this time. Any reports? Jean, do you have anything else to add by way of report? No, I don't. Thanks Paul? for asking. No. Okay. Very good. Um, Mark, are you going to give us a minute of song? Sure. Sure. Give, give, give me a topic. Doug, give me a topic. After I get the different place, I'll do yeah. a soft shoe. After Thursday, man. After Thursday. <laughs> Doug, I know that you're there, but you're behind the uh, the monitor. We can't really see your smiling face. Do you want to move one over or one forward so we can see you? Holly, you're also hidden by the monitor. We don't have that many people here present, although I'm sure we will by Zoom. That's great. Perfect. My face might not always be smiling. Well, your personality always is, Doug. Doug, I'm sorry. Could you go back behind the <laughs> monitor? Very good. Um, it's now 7.20. Uh, I call to order this public hearing on major project site plan special permit number 2022-02557 Highland LLC being an affiliate of the Bullfinch Companies Inc. as petitioner regarding a proposal to redevelop the property located at 557 Highland Avenue. May I have a motion to waive the reading of the notice of hearing? So moved. Second. We have a motion by Paul Alpert and a second by Gene McKnight to waive the reading of the notice of hearing. Any discussion? Hearing none, I come to the vote. Paul Alpert? Aye. Artie Crocker? Aye. And Gene McKnight? Aye. The chair votes aye. We've, uh, uh, the motion passes. Um, I will also actually call the roll. I uh, meant to do that at the beginning of the meeting. I'll call the uh, uh, to make sure that all members are present, which we know physically that they are, but for the record, we should do that. When I say your name, please uh, respond in the affirmative or present. Paul Alpert. Uh, here. Artie Crocker. Here. Jean McKnight. Here. Adam Block is present. I should note that Natasha Spada, a member of the planning board, is, uh, is momentarily delayed. We anticipate her joining either uh, by Zoom shortly or in person uh, this evening as well, and we'll record her presence at that time. Um, uh, and with that, um, uh, our plan for this hearing, for those that are in the room and for those that are home, uh, our plan uh, tonight is to begin with the petitioner, and they'll have uh, up to an hour to present a thorough overview of their application. I will then ask members from the board for any comments and questions they may have for a period of approximately 30 minutes and also summarize the comments we've received from town staff. Thereafter, I will open the hearing for public comment and questions and plan uh, to continue with public comment until 10 o'clock, unless, of course, we've exhausted public comment before then. While the petitioner will provide an overview of traffic and parking elements tonight, we will focus tonight on the details of the site plan, engineering, architecture, and landscaping. Our next hearing scheduled for July 7 will focus on traffic and parking. At, that, uh, at this time, uh, I'll ask Alex to bring over to Zoom the following attendees. I know that we have a number. I just, uh, perhaps as I call your name, you'd be able to uh, uh, say that you are present, and Tim, I'm going to call you up to the desk if you don't mind us biting. Good. Thanks, Tim. So, Robert Schlager. Present. Very good. Eric Wyant and Tom Ertz from Stantec. Present. Present. Uh, I heard two presents. I'm, I saw Eric, and I'm assuming the other was Tom. Uh, very good. Thank you. 
uh, Eric Joseph from uh, Paul Finger Associates. Present. And uh, Paul Finger from Paul Finger Associates. Present. Very good. Adam Jennings from AHA, AHA Engineers. Present. Very good. And Bob Andrews from AHA Engineers. Present, sir. Thank you. Elizabeth Gilman, I apologize for mispronouncing your last name, Dwayne. Have I misspelt it or mispronounced yes, it? Yes. Two for two, present. you're present, and I pronounce your name correctly. Very good. Sean Manning yes. from uh, uh, VHB, VBH. That's the first one, VHB. Present, VHB. Very good, all these acronyms. Uh, and Tim Sullivan, we know you're present from Golston and Stores. Thank you all for being here tonight, and again, thank you for those who've uh, come in person. We're grateful for your engagement here, and also to those on Zoom, we're grateful for your participation as well. Um, I, at this time, Mr. Schlager, would you like to begin? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, and good evening, both Mr. Chairman, members of the planning board, our neighbors, the community, and fellow Edomites. My name is Robert Schlager. I am the a principal of the Bullfinch Companies. We are pleased to be here with you this evening to discuss our proposed redevelopment of the former Muzzy site at 557 Highland Avenue into a world-class research and development and life science center. I'm joined this evening by a fantastic project team that will, make, that will take us through our proposal in more detail. You've met our architect, Principal Eric Wayant of Stantec Archer, Architecture and Design, formerly known as Ad Inc., and he will walk you through the architecture of the site, the buildings, and the overall plan. Paul Finger of Paul Finger Associates, along with Eric Joseph, will review the landscaping elements of the project that include a half-mile walking trail, two pickleball courts, an abundance of open space, and berm landscaping around the entire perimeter. Sean Manning of VHB will highlight the transportation improvements associated with the project. Adam Jennings and Bob Andrews of AHA Consulting Engineers will outline our sustainability and resiliency strategies, all of which represent state-of-the-art design and include well-building certifications, fit-well certifications, and LEED Gold certifications proudly. Elizabeth Graham Betsy of Environmental Health and Engineering, EH&E, will do a brief overview of potential laboratory tenancies in BSL-1 and BSL-2 should those laboratory uses be located in the premises. Tim Sullivan of Goulston and Stores will provide an overview of the zoning relief that is being requested in connection with our application. We also have the following members of our team available to answer any questions and discuss any topics more specifically if needed. They include Nick Scully of VHB, our site engineer, our general counsel, Mark Diorio, our MEPA counsel, Charles Luray, along with several other local counselors and advisors. I'd like to begin <clears throat> our presentation this evening by providing a bit of a background on Bullfinch. We are a third generation commercial real estate firm specializing in the acquisition, development, construction, repositioning, and management of properties primarily across Massachusetts. We were founded by our grandfather, Samuel W. Porvu, in 1936. More importantly, we have deep roots to the town of Needham. We own and manage approximately 1 million square feet of commercial space in the town that generates several million dollars of tax revenues for the town annually. These properties include the former Allen Furniture Building at 251st Ave, which we developed in 1997, the former Gold's Gym, now known as Maxim Healthcare's headquarters at 102nd Ave, the former Polaroid facility at 117 Kendrick Street, the highlight of our solar array, as you will see in our presentation this evening, the former Needham Racquetball Building at 144 Gould Street, 1519 Crawford Street, 
the Needham Heights Post Office and Coco Fit Center at 844 Highland Avenue, along with 53 and 115 Fourth Avenue and several others. As a proud member of the Needham community, a staunch supporter of the Charles River Chamber of Commerce, we understand the importance of developing something special on a site that will be for years to come, the gateway entrance to the town of Needham. As you know, the property is located within the newly created Highway Commercial One District, established by an amendment to the zoning bylaw adopted by a 168 to 37 vote of town meeting on May 3, 2021. Following an extensive public planning process spanning back to 2013, nearly some 10 years ago. Highland Innovation Center, the name we have ascribed to 557 Highland Avenue, is proposed to contain 496,694 square feet of office, laboratory, research and development uses, along with complementary retail restaurant uses, allowing the town to realize all of the planning efforts devoted over the years that created this opportunity. In developing our plan, we have also continued that public process, having spent countless hours over the past several months talking to town boards, town departments, town consultants, neighbors, and members of the community about this project. Most recently, we have held seven neighborhood meetings in the months of April, May, and as recent as June 1st to discuss our plans and to gather public input all with the objective of creating a better project. The project we are presenting this evening to you in detail is a special one. Indeed, a world-class state-of-the-art life science building that incorporates valuable public input from our friends, colleagues, neighbors, and dedicated team of highly qualified professionals. Following hearing our presentation tonight, we hope you will agree that this project together we can be proud of as the new gateway to Needham, leading our town into the 21st century. With that said, I would like to play a short video, which will take roughly two minutes, outlining the project and to give you a brief overview of what's to follow in our formal presentation. Thank you. Please start the video, Eric. Everybody see my screen okay? Yes. And I hope my kids aren't on Wi-Fi and that it doesn't glitch. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> no uh, video uh, audio bar. The audio is playing on my side, is it not? No. I'm not sure I have a fix for that, unfortunately. Um, yeah, I don't see any additional. Oh, share sound. Sorry.
Thank you, Eric. As he prepares for screen share, we'll begin our presentation momentarily. Again, as I outlined earlier, we'll hear from each of the team members. Next slide, please, Eric. Again, a summary of our team. If you look at the consultants involved in the project, it includes over nearly a thousand years of experience between each of the team members dating back to uh, Ad Inc, the founding successing successor entity, Stantec, which is a national company, Simpson, Gumperts, and Hager as our structural engineers, and most importantly, VHB as our traffic consultant. Next slide, please. It's a little bit of an overview, prior site conditions. What was the site previously? The site comprises approximately nine acres of land. It was the site of the former Muzzy Chevrolet, Muzzy Ford building, uh, included a body shop uh, where automobiles were serviced, also included various components of transmission changes, oil changes, fluids, and the like. Next slide, please. So here is the site uh, totally cleared when we acquired the site in, in the month of December of 2021. Our first priority was to remediate as many hazardous chemicals, materials that were on site that we could and abate whatever underground storage tanks still remained. We accomplished that during the months of January and February. By the end of February, completed demolition and began subsurface explorations for any other remaining environmental hazards on the site. Next slide, please. A little bit of summary on Needham. If you go back to the 1920s, before America's technology, Route 128 was built, Needham had a billboard that we uncovered, and that billboard said, Needham welcomes you and the babies. Edison Light and Power, that was actually located next to our uh, um, second half property at 102nd Avenue. You may remember the old Oldsmobile dealership. Between the Oldsmobile dealership and the Gold's Gym property was the Edison Power Plant. Pure spring water, the Coca-Cola uh, wells that are in place still today, parallel to Route 128, opposite 117 Kendrick. High altitude, uh, obviously not as high as Blue Hills, but, but higher than the city of Boston. Good roads, 63 trains a day, excellent schools, three electric car lines, live in Needham to live long. And of course, by now, watch values grow. And we know that that's what happened. A little bit of history on the site. The site was used in the 30s and 40s as a uh, gravel pit where gravel was made, filled, uh, transported via rail to Boston to fill the Back Bay and other areas. It was also used as a radar missile uh, anti-aircraft system, uh, that big golf ball in the middle to the left-hand corner where the cursor is now. And uh, that was uh, through the 1950s. And at one point in time, if you look to the far back left of the screen, that was the original Muzzy dealership, which was a Plymouth dealer. In those days, Plymouth Chrysler had not joined. Plymouth was its own company, and Plymouth uh, had that location. When the rail spur was uh, in existence, uh, rail was very popular, and that's how the gravel was transported to Boston. And over the years, the gravel pit was decommissioned. Uh, the area was filled in. And uh, that's what exists today. And you can see the original depot for the Ford truck building where trucks were serviced right in the center in 1956. You'll also see the start of Evelyn Road in the lower portion of your screen. You'll see no trees, not because of a, because of a Chernobyl event, but rather because uh, things were just starting to grow. Yale Road was being developed. Uh, single family homes were being built, built and trees were uh, just starting to be planted and ultimately what exists today is certainly a fully grown in area. Uh, again, New England Industrial Center in the foreground and the old Allen Furniture Building right under the words First Ave can be seen on the far right-hand corner of your uh, slide presentation. And uh, I'm pleased to say that Eric Wyant, who I have worked with now for over 20 years, was the principal architect of 250 First Avenue. And the other building that uh, Ad Inc, or now known as Stantec, designed in Needham was 160 Gould Street, which is also uh, still in existence today as, as one of the larger office buildings in Needham. Next slide, please. Eric, I'm going to turn it over to you for the architectural overview. Thanks, Robert. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name, again, is Eric Wyant. I'm a design principal at Stantec Architecture in Boston, formerly 
at Inc, as Robert has mentioned. Um, I know we have a number of presenters tonight. I know we have a number of slides, so I'm going to try and, and move as quickly as, as I can, um, knowing that we can always revisit some slides during the Q&A. Uh, this first slide is really meant to, to kind of remind folks of what was uh, included as part of the rezoning uh, process. This is a diagram showing essentially the 3D uh, maximum zoning envelope that was allowed by special permit. This was a, a zoning envelope that went up to a 1.35 FAR. Our current proposal is a little shy of that at 1.25 FAR. And just to remind folks um, about the kind of particulars or details of, of this rezoning process, um, essentially along Gould and Highland, uh, there was a 50 foot landscape setback from the property line along those two edges. It drops down to a 20 foot landscape setback on uh, the 128 side and similarly around the back on TV place. Once you go back from that uh, 50 foot landscape setback, you're allowed to go up to 42 feet in height again along Highland and Gould. Once you step back 200 feet from the property line, you're allowed to go up to 70 feet uh, in height. And it was in that uh, zone as that they stipulated the location of the structured parking garage, although it was capped at 55 feet in height and a maximum floor plate size of 42,000 square feet. This is a rendering showing what was submitted in our April special permit application. Um, as the video alluded, there have been some changes um, that we have been making as part of the community outreach um, process that we've been going through that we'll walk through um, but we wanted to remind people um, what was submitted and then show the kind of um, proposed updates from that so in essence the building is broken down into three key components there's what we call the south building which has primary frontage along highland ave here it's three stories and 42 feet in height Stepping up from that in the inter internal portion of the site is what we call the north building. This is five stories and 70 feet in height. And connecting with two buildings is a two-story um, atrium space. This is the front door for the building. Um, you can enter into this building and then make your way into both the north and south building. In addition, it will have amenity space for the tenants of the building. Moving northward from the, the uh, office and life science building, uh, again, in the location that it was uh, stipulated is the parking garage, 55 feet in height. Um, and around the perimeter of the site, we had this idea of creating uh, a jogging, walking uh, fitness path. It's a half mile long uh, path that goes around the entire perimeter of the site. There are exercise stations along um, that path. And when you get to the corner at Highland and Gould, it turns into a retail plaza. Um, we have 10,000 square feet of retail as part of this proposal, and the outdoor retail plaza was um, meant to accompany that. It's a place to have outdoor tables and chairs, a place where um, the retail space can kind of spill out into that plaza. We also have a water feature at the corner. We know um, the former muzzy um, water feature that you know lots of people love, so we've done a kind of reinterpretation of that idea um, that our landscape architect uh, Eric Joseph can walk through uh, momentarily. I should back up for one second. The, the proposed program uh, total was just shy of 507,000 square feet. Again, as I mentioned before, it's about a 1.25 FAR, and we're proposing 1,400 uh, hair over, 1,400 parking spaces as part of the project, which is actually a reduction from what is required um, by zoning, which would be roughly about 1,770 spaces. As Robert mentioned, we have had um, lots of uh, input from the community, lots of input from uh, different town departments. We've had seven uh, community meetings, each lasting about an hour and a half to two hours, uh, providing a lot of great insight, a lot of great, great feedback, um, comments, a lot of things that have really helped um, to shape what we have uh, developed since submitting the special permit application. So this is just a, a quick timeline that shows uh, those meetings and the frequency of them. As just a high level overview of what is kind of um, changed or what we're proposing to change as part of um, the community input, um, we have a list here. Um, really the first four items are kind of landscape open space elements. 
um, increased landscaping and screening along Highland Ave along that fitness path, increased diversity of planting to ensure the visual interest during the growing season, again, uh, around the perimeter of the site. Uh, three, increased setback dimension of the walking path to Highland Ave. We pushed back that uh, walking path a little bit closer to the building to get a little bit more separation from Highland Ave. And then the fourth element, uh, a Gould Street amenity space, which we've expanded um, this location here along Gould Street to provide two pickleball courts, uh, seasonal ice skating, uh, an expanded flexible lawn space, uh, and a shade structure or pergola. The next couple of items are really more architectural in nature. Item number five, um, we had uh, a larger kind of loading dock experience on both the north and south building. We reduced those basically by half uh, each of them and provided more windows, more active use spaces. Um, we've also um, updated the massing. We now have kind of bent the building back um, the three-story south building, similar to the north building, um, which has pulled the massing off of the corner of Gould and Highland, um, which has helped to soften that corner. It has also provided an additional 5,500 square feet of open space. Um, we have reduced the length of the building across Highland Ave. We've taken a third of it again and kind of pushed it internal to the site. Um, in terms of uh, retail ideas, you know, we've talked to the community a lot. We kind of came away with um, the main takeaway being that this may not be the ideal location for a brewery. We've heard a lot of um, comments and feedback that this should be a more family friendly um, food service kind of retail space, an amenity space that uh, is really a retail space, excuse me, that is an amenity to the neighborhood. Um, so we focused on that going forward. Item number 10, um, we've committed to um, stay at BSL levels one and two. We will not be going for BSL level three. We will not be going for BSL level four uh, in terms of our laboratory use. And then lastly, uh, we have uh, increased our commitment to EV um, plug-in stations across the site to 25%. And then one other bullet point that fell off this list, uh, above the entire footprint of the garage, we're actually um, hoping to include a PV solar array um, it's a little bit um, it's a little bit undefined in the zoning in terms of how we we can accomplish that, but it's an idea that we're interested in pursuing and obviously working with the town to achieve. So this is that same uh, perspective aerial rendering showing some of these updates. Um, just making my way around the, the image, you can see the Gould Street amenities with the two pickleball courts, the expanded lawn space, the sh the um, pergola and shade structure. Um, as you make your way around the, the perimeter, the half mile walking and fitness loop remains the same. Um, and then in terms of some of the architectural um, and massing moves, we eliminated some loading bait dock bays that were on the north building. We eliminated some that were on the south building. It's a little hard to see here in the shadow. We've increased the number of windows. We've increased the uh, program space behind them, the active use space. Uh, and then in terms of the massing, you can see now with the building kind of bending away from the corner, it steps down from three stories to a one story retail expression, and then it steps down to the outdoor retail plaza. Previously, the, the retail space or the retail plaza was primarily along Gould. Now it's a little bit more centered on this corner. Uh, this gets terrific south sun, so it'll be a really fantastic place to um, have a lunch outside, read the paper, have a cup of coffee, etc. So I wanted to do a few before and afters again, um, showing the planning board members what was previously submitted as part of the special special permit application and then the subsequent changes that we're now proposing. So this is the, the old design, if you will, part of the special permit application floating above Highland Ave in Gould. You can see that uh, outdoor retail space um, along the length of the building here. And then the new proposed design which pulls back the massing, steps it down to a much more pedestrian level, much more pedestrian friendly experience at this corner. We have additional open space at this edge as well. Um, across the walking path and fitness path, we've pushed that closer to the building. We've nearly doubled the amount of trees and plantings across Highland Ave, um, creating more screening from, from the cars to the path. 
can also see in the background here some of the Gould Street amenities, the pickleball and the shade structure and lawn. This is now a pedestrian level, an eye level view standing at the corner of Gould and Highland, where again you can see the previous uh, design, which was part of the special permit application and the subsequent improvements um, that have come based on that community input and really trying to soften this corner, make it a much more um, pedestrian, a much more a welcoming environment. We think the, the experience of seeing the building both coming into town from Newton and also um, making your way westbound um, will be a much more, much more improved um, experience from the, from the past design. I'd now like Eric Joseph to maybe walk through in a similar fashion the kind of before and after of the, of the site plan and some of the landscape features. Thanks, Eric. And thank you, members of the board. Appreciate the opportunity to present the project to you. Uh, for the record, my name is Eric Joseph. I'm a landscape architect with Paul Finger and Waltham. Excuse me, and Eric. As Eric mentioned, I know there's a lot to review and to discuss. Eric? So, yeah. I apologize. Yes, yes. yes. I apologize to inter uh, interrupting you and Paul. The audio in here is actually a little muddled. It's a little difficult to okay. hear what you're saying. If you could either speak a little louder and a little enunciate perhaps a little clearer, that's true for everyone presenting from Zoom and for members of the public, uh, sure. just by the acoustics in this room, I, it's a little challenging. Yeah. I apologize, thank you very much. No, no, thank you very much. Is this better? Yes. Um, okay, great. So what makes this project uh, exciting from a landscape standpoint is the is Bullfinch's dedication to uh, promoting public use of the property and uh, the buffer that we what they wanted to look at in terms of softening the view. So to that extent, we use this opportunity to create variety of different spaces for the public. Starting with the community open space, we wanted this to be uh, more of a park-like setting. Nope, actually, Eric, if you can go back to the other plan. Thank you. So starting with community open space, the thought was is that on the upper left-hand corner is create more of a park-like setting with a fitness path that's meandering through it. We were looking at mature trees, four inches in caliper or greater, I'm uh, talking with the town arborist. We had some great ideas in terms of using some pin oaks and uh, some linden, some locusts um, as the initial buffer. And then on the other side of that park like setting, we actually have additional trees for a secondary buffer line. And then on the opposite side of the parking lot, we actually have another row of trees. So there's three levels of buffer there uh, for views from Gold Street. But the intent was to use the space as a park space for uh, the neighborhood to come gather, uh, the, you know, trying to be sensitive to the environment. We're looking at instead of, uh, you know, a typical sod, we're looking at actually sod that uses sort of micro clover. So that cuts down in the amount of, of um, uh, watering that needs to be done and the amount of maintenance. And then quickly moving in a clockwise fashion because I want to speed this up. Uh, You'll notice that we go into some smaller uh, open spaces by the retail area. Then we have the retail plaza where we're looking at some pavers. This is a little bit more of an urban type of setting where, again, we have some mature trees along uh, Gold Street and then coming around Highland. We have the opportunity for the water feature to install the water feature back. Uh, and then as we round the corner, now here's another experience for the public to enjoy, which is a fitness path that allows different types of plant communities uh, along the path. We have uh, open trees on the right-hand side and then more ornamental plantings uh, within the building area, leading down to the retention pond for another plant community. And along this path, there's gonna be a number of fitness stations uh, for people to exercise in with some uh, passive uh, fitness equipment. And then the, the path leads back around the garage, and as Eric mentioned, it's a half mile path. So that's where we started with, and through some great ideas with the neighborhood, uh, and also with uh, some town consultants. Go ahead, Eric, and change. We actually are proposing a number of improvements to this. One of the things that we heard was that there was concern about plantings and how much lawn there was. There was thought that maybe there was going to be a lot of lawn. 
we actually reduce the amount of lawn that's going to be here to just down to two, three percent of the property. And then there's another segment of lawn area that's actually what we consider no mow lawn, which is basically a lawn that you only have to mow once a year. It grows to about six inches in height and then falls over and almost resembles more of like a meadow. We also introduced a meadow seed mix along the buffer along 128. So again, just these different communities. But what we're trying to do is cut down the amount of lawn area because we understood that was a concern. And we increased the number of plantings. We went from somewhere in the neighborhood of 80 trees to now we're around 140 trees, deciduous, evergreen, a great variety. We increased the number of trees along Gould and along Highland. The thought being is that we reduced the trees were one to every 80 feet. Now they're one to every 40 to 50 feet. So again, we're softening those views up. And then as we come around the corner of the retail plaza, going along the fitness path, we understood that this was a major concern for a number of neighborhoods. And the thought was the concern was is that the fitness path is too close to Highland Avenue. They wanted a little bit more of a buffer. So Eric, you want to go to the next slide? So what we actually looked at doing was actually moving the fitness path closer to the building and actually now creating a solid hedge as a barrier in between Highland as well as the path. And then to soften that hedge barrier, we have a variety of different types of plant materials on either side of it. We have some ornamental tree on the left hand side of it. We've got some lavender. We've got some salvia. And then, of course, some daylily. So again, we're looking at also blooming, trying to get blooming from early spring to May throughout the summer. So we're just trying to create this exciting diversity of plant material all along this path. And then one of the other areas that was brought up was the open space in terms of how can we make it bigger? How can we make it more of an opportunity for the neighborhood? So we actually widened it. We widened it so we can provide a couple of pickleball courts and then a nice lawn area. And then that's actually probably going to be more of an artificial turf only because the thought being is that there's an opportunity here to take that green outlined area and actually cover it with a skating rink. So this way now we have some seasonal use for the area. And along with that, we have a pavilion that we were proposing alongside of it. So this way it's another gathering area, also a place to either cool off during the summer months or actually gather during the winter months, put the skating rink, you know, the skating on. And then we, you know, we have a lawn area to the other side of it. And this is more of a passive use. The thought being here is a variety of activities between kids activities or yoga activities or food trucks. The thought was just to provide more of a potential for the neighborhood to come and gather and to use it as they actually see fit. So there's a number of other improvements that we've done to the landscaping aside from increasing the number of plantings and number of, you know, reducing the lawn area. But I know we're running short on time. So I'm actually going to turn it over to the next. I'm going to speed up a little bit. These are showing the improvements that we've made to the loading docks. Again, this is just a little bit of information that I'm getting from the Department of Transportation. We've actually added two additional docks for loading docks. This is the Highland Docks, which is currently 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 currently
Uh, this was a view that was asked at a number of the community meetings. We only recently added it, but we wanted to make sure that we showed it. This is a view uh, taken from the intersection of Sachem and David. So this is looking at the previous design, again, where the, the, the uh, building along uh, Highland stretched really from corner to corner. And then here with the updated design, now with the building bending back, it's a much softer, uh, much more gracious kind of uh, relationship from that intersection to the, the massing beyond. Um, I know this is a, a difficult drawing to, to look at. There's a lot of information that we're trying to pack into it. This is showing a rooftop um, kind of plan or, or perspective showing the mechanical equipment that will be on top of the roofs of each the north and the south building. Uh, the key takeaway from this slide is that uh, we are fully compliant with the roof screen height being a maximum 15 feet. We are fully compliant with the rooftop mechanical equipment uh, also being uh, capped at 15 feet. Um, and we are fully compliant with the maximum roof coverage of both enclosed uh, mechanical penthouse spaces and uh, the um, rooftop equipment itself at 25%. Um, just diagrammatically, uh, the building is broken, uh, each building is broken down uh, into four pairs of air handlers. So there's a pair at the front and at the rear of each of the buildings. And then there are two more pairs that are internal um, to the plan layout. Because of the, the organization of the, these buildings, uh, it's critical to have kind of an even distribution of this equipment across the mechanical penthouse. Uh, levels. Just a little bit more uh, detail in terms of what the facade uh, approach is. Um, we're thinking about a very kind of warm, uh, earth toned, um, almost terracotta coloration um, of this material here. This is a GFRC, which stands for glass fiber reinforced concrete um, panel. It's about a one or two inch thick panel. Um, we're hoping to panelize the entire building into a series of modules that will come. Uh, with the windows already set into it so that the erection time for the project for the facade will be a little bit quicker. Uh, across the top of the building where we have our mechanical roof screens, we have a very um, interesting kind of profiled metal panel. Um, we have some expanses of curtain wall that you can see here um, and some charcoal metal panel that uh, frames those elements. And then at the main entry, that atrium space, we have this idea of kind of a gradient of mullions and white metal panel. Uh, and you can see here the coloration that we're kind of going for um, with the um, GFRC material for the facade. Uh, usually when people hear GFRC, GFRC, they think of a 1980s kinds of buildings, um, but this is a material that is uh, incredibly flexible and incredibly interesting um, for architects to work with. We wanted to show some precedent images of what can be done with this material. Um, you can have a variety of, of textures and forms across the surface of it. Um, you can do lots of interesting compositional things with the windows. Um, and then here you can see an example of what we're planning to do in terms of panelizing the facade, again, so that it, the, the panel comes uh, with the windows already installed and it can go up uh, in a much more quickly, quick uh, and a, uh, simple manner. In terms of the parking garage, um, this is going to be a structural precast um, expression for all of the garage structure and facade kind of key elements. Uh, we've done these uh, a number of times on a number of projects. You can uh, achieve a, a number of textures and finishes as well. This is an example uh, of a project in Cambridge that we did. We do have some glass kind of curtain wall expression at the head house where the, the primary stair and elevator are. Um, and then we have some uh, perforated uh, aluminum screening across that curtain wall expression, uh, perhaps some wayfinding with some uh, signage and identification for the garage uh, incorporated into it. And then the, the biggest feature really is uh, a series of fabric um, screens that are installed really around the perimeter of the project. Uh, we've done this successfully on another garage, uh, two garages actually in Cambridge. You can see an example here uh, of that garage. In that case, we used a local uh, flora and fauna kind of diagram uh, that was zoomed up and enlarged um, to create some real visual interest. It helps to, to not only screen the garage, 
um, during the day and provide some visual interest, but at nighttime, it also helps to cut down on some of the internal lighting that happens to come through some of those uh, spandrel areas. Uh, a little blow up here, just showing the corner uh, improvement as part of the new proposed uh, design where we have retail uh, really wrapping the corner at, at both Gould and Highland. Uh, now this expanded uh, retail plaza, the footprint of the retail space, again, about 10,000 square feet. Uh, because of its configuration, it really lends itself well to um, breaking down into a, a series of smaller uh, retail shops along Gould or a couple of larger ones. Uh, kind of facing the corner, or if they find the right tenant, um, this can all be, you know, one or two retail tenants. This is just a quick view standing on Highland, looking at the um, corner of that retail space, again, where it steps down to one story in height. Uh, there's a mixture of hardscape and softscape at this corner. There'll be outdoor seating, benches, tables and chairs. Uh, and because of the southern exposure, it'll be a really fantastic place to, to sit. And, as I mentioned at the top of the presentation, uh, you know, a real focus on kind of community focused retail spaces, um, not looking at a brewery, looking at more family friendly. We'd love a food service place, a place for, for um, people to come, families to come and, and be able to enjoy the cor this corner of the site. Uh, these are my last two perspectives before I turn it over to um, Adam Jennings to walk through sustainability. This is a view now floating on the 128 side of the project and the previous um, iteration that's, that was part of the special permit application where you can see the Highland, the South building really extending across the length of Highland, and then here the updated where the building starts to bend back. One of the really cool things and exciting things about this atrium is that not only is it the front door to the elevation as you enter in off of Gould Street, but that atrium space actually squeezes its way between the North and South building and reappears on the 128 side. This is again a kind of an amenity rich space so very active uses will be a really um, great inside out and outside in experience um, that fitness and jogging trail as you make your way around the corner uh, and the back side of the site the detention retention pond there's an overlook bridge um, that makes its way over that water feature and here you can start to see some of those graphic banners that are um, wrapping essentially the, in, the entire limits of the garage and then lastly um, the idea of a PV solar array above the top deck of parking. Um, with that, Adam, can you walk through some of the sustainability features of our project? Sure. Thank you, Eric, and, and thank you to the planning board for having us. Um, my name is Adam Jennings with AHA Consulting Engineers. I'm the Energy and Sustainability Department Manager. So I'm going to overview some of the sustainability measures. Really, a lot of what has been talked about tonight really feeds into the sustainability and energy goals for the project. Uh, a few just to quantify some of the impacts that the, the project is having. On the mechanical side, we're using high efficiency chillers and condensing boilers. Um, paired with a lot of high efficiency energy recovery, we're expecting the building to use 70% less natural gas than a typical code compliant uh, lab office building like this. We're also continuing to evaluate options to do hybrid heating which is uh, basically in the, the shoulder months, rather than using natural gas, you're using heat pumps uh, to grab as much heat out of the air and push that into the building to, again, minimize natural gas usage and lower greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, on the electric side, just one thing to highlight, if we can fit, we're anticipating about 500 kilowatts of solar on the rooftop, um, that would produce enough electricity annually for about 78 homes. Uh, there's potential also to include some on the north and south buildings. Uh, on a plumbing side or just looking at water use, we're doing rainwater capture from the north and south buildings, and those are going to be treated and used in the building um, for flushing uh, toilets and urinals and potentially outdoors for landscape uh, irrigation. Indoors, because of the lead uh, standard, basically the high efficiency, low flow fixtures that we typically use, we save about 30 to 40% of the indoor water use compared to a typical building. When you add in rainwater capture and reuse, that can get up to 70% or higher um, reduction in water use. So it's really impactful uh, measures there. And then just at a, a whole building level, um, planning on doing what's called a whole building life cycle assessment. So this looks at the types of materials that are used for the building and evaluates their environmental impact from the time that they're um, dug up from the ground through transportation use in the building and an eventual um, 
disposal of those materials. So some of the big impactful materials there are concrete and steel. So we're evaluating the impacts of those materials and finding alternatives that can help lower the, the overall environmental impact. Um, next slide, please. So there's, we've talked about three different certification systems that are, are being committed to for the project. So this is an example checklist um, for LEED. The other ones that have been mentioned are WELL and FITWELL. <clears throat> so LEED is basically uh, leadership in energy and environmental design really focuses on making the building as, as efficient energy-wise and environmentally as possible. Um, there are multiple different strategies across a variety of, of categories here that, that feed into that, and we're committing to LEED Gold, which 40 points is the minimum to get LEED certified, and then there's LEED Silver at 50 points, and we're committing to Gold at 60 points. Um, and then finally, um, the other two certification systems that we've talked about well and fit well um, in a way they're both um, taking different approaches at looking at the the health and wellness of the users of the building so we're lead really focused on overall building um, use and emissions lead uh, fit well and well focus on the occupants themselves so the one great example we've talked about the fitness path and the exercise stations that are going around the building that's great amenity for the neighborhood it's also great to encourage movement um, and fitness for the users of the building um, it also includes uh, quarterly at least air monitoring and water quality testing indoor air quality to really make sure that everything's is um, to a high standard of performance uh, and i would say that the one difference between Fitwell is really geared towards making sure you have the policies in place to make it a, a healthy building. And then WELL incorporates that third-party certification similar to, to LEED, which I skipped over. But both of these include a, a third party who comes in and reviews your documents, or in WELL's case, they actually go out to the site and do a lot of this testing to make sure that it's as healthy and safe uh, building as, you're, as we're committing to. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Betsy? Good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. My name is Betsy Gilman Duane, and I'm an environmental health and safety consultant with environmental health and engineering in Needham and Newton. Um, just a quick overview on life science and the industry. Um, as you know, the, the tenants may include um, life science laboratories. Um, in Massachusetts, we have a booming industry in life sciences. And in many suburban communities outside of Boston and Cambridge, we're seeing developments um, come alive with life science labs. Pfizer and Moderna are two really great examples of some of the innovation that we've seen in Massachusetts and the local area. Um, these opportunities provide great jobs for people, um, as well as bring life-saving medicines and therapies to our society. Next slide. Just a quick industry comparison. Uh, in our community meetings, we spent um, you know, some time talking about life sciences labs and the controls that are in place and the materials that are used. But very briefly, in a life science lab, we have smaller amounts and types of biological materials and chemicals as compared to, say, a hospital lab or an automotive service automotive body shop or heavy industry type of environment. So in terms of chemicals in your industries, like automotive, um, you're seeing like 55 gallon drums of chemicals. That's not the case in life sciences labs where the containers are, are very small. Um, hospital labs work with a great deal of patient blood and other biologicals. As you can see in the life sciences photo at the top left there, they're working with very small volumes in small containers. So there's a big difference. Um, for biosafety, we spent a lot of time talking about the different lot levels. And as Eric mentioned earlier, we'll be limiting to biosafety level one and level two. Um, also, the town of um, Needham has a um, health department regulation that covers biosafety. Um, just a quick overview of level one. Um, these are very low or no risk materials. Um, examples include DNA sequencing, protein extraction, or perhaps working with a very harmless strain of E. coli bacteria. Um, and the lab and the controls are not very complex. Next slide. 
So at biosafety level two, we step it up a notch. These are materials that pose risk to the individual, um, but very low or no community risk and absolutely no airborne pathogens or any pathogens that can be spread via the inhalation route are worked on in these labs. Um, some good examples include human blood, salmonella bacteria, that's a bacteria that causes food poisoning. Um, most gene therapy research also um, can be conducted safely at biosafety level two. And you see in this photo, the scientists working in what we call a biosafety cabinet. That's one of the controls that's pretty standard in a biosafety level two lab. So the industry as a whole has a very high profile for safety and the landlord and the tenants are also responsible for making sure that um, there is safety for not only the lab employees, but also for the community external Thank to the you, lab. Betsy. Sean, if you could do kind of an uh, accelerated presentation, I know we're going to be talking about transportation at the next um, Atlantic Planning Board meeting, so maybe a quicker I, I, I have certainly been anticipating that. So, Eric, thank you. And planning board members and Needham residents, thanks again for the opportunity to present tonight. Uh, I know we will be coming back and doing a deeper dive on transportation, uh, as mentioned previously, but I also know traffic is uh, of concern to many. And let's give you uh, some high points of what we're proposing and what we've been talking to the community about over the past month or so. So to just sort of back up uh, to the zoning effort and those who have been following the rezoning effort in the town know that as part of that, uh, a third party consultant, Greenman Peterson, GPI, was commissioned to help understand what the traffic impacts might be of different alternatives that could go with such a rezoning effort. And that's something that we studied very, very closely uh, very early on when we were brought into this project to understand what those improvements might be and how would they relate to this project. And what I can tell you is uh, in close collaboration with both the town and with MassDOT, because of our proximity to Route 128, we do need to collaborate with MassDOT. Uh, it seemed totally appropriate to adopt those improvements in connection uh, with our traffic study and with the improvements that will go with the project. And I'll share a couple of slides with you uh, in a minute on that. The other thing is related to our community input as it relates to TDM, transportation demand management. Obviously very important to try and get people out of cars as best we can and use uh, complete mobility solutions. You've heard a lot about EV. Obviously we're on the precipice of uh, sort of changing the way that we that we do drive and having those EV charging stations to uh, reflect those future mar market conditions are gonna be hugely important. Uh, we're also committed to having EV shuttle buses that, that interconnect our site to those nearby transit nodes, be it the Green Line, Needham Heights, commuter rail. This is hugely important with Class A office and life science space in 128 uh, to get uh, those folks that live in downtown Boston really make sure that we maximize the talent pool uh, for the tenants that will work in this building. Uh, the other thing that I will mention are, are other improvements that, that came up during our community conversations, including Noah Net Road, which is up the street. It's our understanding that there's a lot of cut through traffic that happens between Gould and Central Avenue. It's posing a traffic signal at Central and Gould, which I'll show you in a second, to give people gaps and really reduce that opportunity for cut through traffic on Noah Net. But we're gonna supplement that with some other means of intervention, including signage that is going to uh, tell people that they, they cannot cut through the neighborhood during weekday peak commuter hours, and then back that up with uh, information sharing and enforcement with the Needham Police that the proponent would uh, support. Uh, why don't we go to the next slide, please, Eric. So, so this is showing uh, our site, uh, sort of the far right hand uh, side of the of the page is Highland Avenue going from right to left is Gould Street going going northbound. These are the improvements that we would put in place, and really, it's it's an adoption uh, again of the of the zoning effort that was ratified two years ago. And why don't we zoom in uh, to the first intersection? So, so here at Gould and Highland, and and I'll just sort of point out, you know, kind of those those key improvements. The big thing is is getting left turning vehicles from Gould onto Highland into 128. For all of you in Needham, you know, for a very long time, Gould does have a left turn lane. It's very, very 
short and the queues on Gould in particular pre-pandemic are very long. The idea here is that this improvement in connection with those recent improvements, the, you know, first and foremost, the rebuild of the Highland Interchange by MassDOT and now the ongoing improvements on Highland Avenue coupled with this improvement uh, are going to fix a long-standing pre-existing condition. The other thing I want to mention here, if you look at the little green specs, the, the rezoning effort did not contemplate bike lanes at the time. We certainly believe having complete mobility for pedestrians, cars, and bicycles is hugely important. The other thing that I'll mention, and this is a more recent uh, turn of events, uh, lots of feedback from the community about trying to find a way to have these bike lanes be separated bike lanes, namely bike lanes that are at the elevation of the sidewalk, not on the street. I will tell you that Robert has given us the direction to go ahead and see as best we can to try and figure out how to do that. We obviously need to work very closely with Needham DPW and Mass DOT. This is a Mass DOT intersection uh, to get their input on that design, but we're committed to doing that to have the safest bike solution possible. We can go to the next slide. This is the main driveway, uh, obviously a location that has not been signalized. Uh, signalizing to manage queues, manage opportunities for people to cross the street, in particular those folks at Wingate that want to come over and use all the great amenity space, give them ADA compliant uh, crossing opportunities that, that are certainly safe and manage traffic as safe as we can. And we can go to the next slide, please. This is TV Place, and again, we want to manage volume here at TV Place. This serves uh, Channel 5. Uh, that piece of property is not changing at all, but we still need to manage that traffic over the long term and, again, uh, manage bike volumes uh, in front of our corridor. As you get past TV Place, Gould Street narrows back down. It becomes much more residential. Once we get to that point, it, it becomes more challenging to introduce bike lanes. We will likely go to Sharrows at that point, which is a share the road symbols and signs uh, because of that narrowness. We can click again. And then at Gould and Central, adding a traffic signal, more so to create gaps and slow traffic down on Central Ave as opposed to managing heavy traffic volumes. And, and before we turn away, just a couple of other things that were relatively new. We did get some feedback on hunting road and one of the things we're going to do relative to speeds on hunting road is consider radar embedded speed limit signs and again back that up with enforcement to try and slow folks down and then a really recent development uh, a comment came in about those folks that want to that are in the no net neighborhood that want to come uh, to our open space that the sidewalk conditions along gould uh, are not terribly good and, and that was a very recent commitment by Bullfinch, which is not in the slides, but when we come back in, in July, we will certainly have those updates. But uh, rebuilding those sidewalks from the Noanet Gould intersection up to our site is, is now part of the project, I'm happy to report. So thank you very much. Look forward to coming back in a month and sharing a lot more detailed information with you, but uh, happy to answer any folks' questions this evening. Thanks. Thank you, Sean. Uh, Tim, do you wanna take it from here? Thanks, Robert. Uh, for the record, Tim Sullivan of the Board. Um, we submitted uh, an extensive application, which included a letter from the going through the zoning, the zoning districts, the relief we're asking for, and how we comply. So uh, I will just touch on those things uh, tonight. So first, just to talk about the relief we're asking for. Is this on? Yes, excuse me. Can you bring the mic closer to you? Sure. Uh, even closer. Even closer. Is that better? Uh, I don't know. His, his, his mic may not be on. Is it on? Same. Try it now. Okay. okay. Sure. I'll, I'll speak louder. So, so just first to talk about the relief we're requesting, um, and I'll touch on the special permits by categories of what we're asking for. So first, with respect to uh, relief under the Highway Commercial 1 dimensional requirements, so we're asking for, as the board knows, the Highway Commercial 1 district um, allows for certain, as of right, dimensionals allowed to go up by special permit. So we're asking for uh, an FAR floor area ratio of 1.25. We're also asking for, with respect to the north building, a height of 70 feet and five stories. 
With respect to the south building, a height of 42 feet and three stories, and a parking structure of 55 feet. So those are the special permits we're requesting under the Highway Commercial One. We're also requesting special permits for use. Uh, as Eric and others talked about, we do want to have restaurant retail type uses complementary to the office uh, laboratory use. So we're asking for a special permit for restaurant, which is required, uh, as well as if we have a single retailer that goes above 5,750 square feet, up to 10,000 square feet, you need a special permit for that. That will be defined based on final tenanting and the like, but we want to have that relief so we have that ability for those, for those complementary uses. Uh, we're also asking for a special permit for parking. As we, as Eric and others noted, the parking required based on the zoning bylaw is 1,689. Uh, but we're proposing 1,408 spaces, so we're asking for the relief for that delta. Our application materials demonstrate uh, how that, uh, that supply satisfies the demand. VHB submitted analysis. We walked through that in our application, so we're asking for that relief. <clears throat> this site also has significant grades to it, so uh, certain retaining walls are above four feet, and that requires a special permit. And then finally, as a project that has more than 10,000 square feet or 25 or more parking spaces, we need major project site plan review special permit. So we spent a lot of time on this project and the application goes through in detail, you know, the, the landscaping, the buffering, the transportation, the loading, um, the tax revenues here, uh, net of costs are over $5 million. The sustainability we talked about, this site is an impervious completely impervious site that we'll do environmental cleanup on and have advanced stormwater on. So uh, as well as light noise pol uh, pollution is mitigated here. We have, you know, current standards for cutoff lighting for mechanicals and the like. And of course, there's a number of amenities, not only for the building with sustainability, lead, wellness, but also the walking paths, the buffering, the neighborhood, taking away that impervious area. So all of that really goes to the requirements that we have on the slides here, but I won't go through in detail because they are in the application. Happy to answer any questions when we get to that point. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. Just in Mr. conclusion. I'm not sure if there's an echo. Your mic's not on. Yeah, uh, Tim, you're going to have to turn off your microphone. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sullivan and Mr. Schlager. Hi. Uh, I see that there's been a number of updates from um, the packet that we had received based on plans from March 30th. Um, I would now like to um, uh, take an opportunity to um, invite my colleagues for any uh, comments or questions, and I'll start with you, Paul, alphabetically. Um. Thank you, thank you, but um, I'm, I'm going to pass for now. Um, I'm kind of overwhelmed. It, it's, it's a very large project. There's a lot of information. Um, I'd like to hear from those who are, in, who are here from, from the uh, neighbors um, and see what they have to say before I start asking questions. Um, I just note that on some of the zoning relief, um, except for the FAR, but for the building heights, um, you seem to be asking for the maximum that are allowed by the special permit. I just note that for the record. Um, and um, other than that, uh, it, it looks like a great project. There's, and it also looks like um, the developer has listened closely to the neighbors at the community meetings and have incorporated a lot of their suggestions, and I greatly appreciate that. Thank you. Artie? I certainly have questions, but I, I actually agree with Paul. I'd love to hear from the public before, uh, before we step into the fray. I think that'd be great to make sure we give them as much chance as possible. So thanks, Paul. Great idea. I'll, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Alex, do you know, can you see whether Natasha is present on Zoom? Um, can we stop sharing your screen? Uh, Eric, can we ask you to stop sharing your screen momentarily, please? I, I am present, Adam. I've been oh. listening in, and I, I'll be there momentarily.
Okay, so I will hold on you momentarily and allow you to get here. Uh, safe driving in the meantime, and in the interim, I'll call on Jean. Do you have any comments? Yes. Um, I did attend one of the community meetings and uh, came away with a few concerns, and I'm glad to see that some of them have been addressed, but I still do have some questions. Um, there, what I was glad to see addressed was uh, what looked like a long, un unbroken, uninteresting building along Highland Avenue. And that being the way we all travel into our town, I just didn't like the looks of that building. Um, I think uh, making the facade of that building considerably shorter and putting in a plaza at the end um, is a very good improvement to the plan. So I'm glad to see that. Um, and I don't know whether any further um, design Im improvements to the facade of the building are needed. I did read the, the letter from the Design Review Board and it, it, that board didn't seem to have any major issues, so perhaps the changes that were made are sufficient. Um, um, I was concerned about the five um, uh, loading dock uh, stations, um, two, you know, three on one building, two on the other, and now I see that's been reduced to three, two on um, is the, the north building and one on the south building. So it's better than five for sure. But um, with regard to the two um, loading docks on the north building, I look at the site plan and I wonder, couldn't those delivery vehicles and vehicles coming in and take away the trash, couldn't they come from the north driveway off TV place, drive by the garage, and go into the north facing facade of that north building, rather than the front facing facade facing Gould Street, which is where you look at the building. And to look at the building and see two loading docks, um, just seems like the plan can be improved. And I would like to suggest that some consideration be given to having that kind of access by vehicles um, and loading docks be on the north side of that building. Um, I really should probably can't answer that question right now, but I put it out there. Um, and then I know uh, when, when we were considering the rezoning, at first the planning board put in a, uh, or considered a setback from Gould and Harland that was not the full 50 feet. But we were convinced after the many hearings we had that um, people really wanted that 50 foot landscaped setback all around the property. Um, and I see the, um, the jogging path. Uh, I realize that uh, the way it's worded in the zoning bylaw that paths and driveway entrances, of course, are allowed in the 50 feet. You have to allow driveways. Um, uh, but I, I don't see on the plan something that I understand our own uh, fire department is seeking. I understand that it's seeking a driveway sufficient for uh, emergency vehicles, fire trucks, all around that south building on that um, frontage, on that supposed landscape setback between Highland Avenue and the South Building. Um, I have a couple of questions about that. I'd like to see it on a plan. Is it really true? Uh, you know, how far do we have to go to provide that um, driveway? And also, uh, can the paving material be the kind of block pavers that allow grass to grow through? I mean, if the purpose is to provide access to fire vehicles, they're not coming in there every day, um, and as long as it's solid enough to hold up the vehicles in that emergency situation. So I'd like to ask that question and see if that can be addressed by the landscape people and in consultation with our fire department. Um, 
So uh, I saw the reference to transportation demand management plan. Um, I'm very pleased to see that the applicant understands that would want to see that. Um, I mean, I was impressed a couple of years ago uh, with the uh, permitting that was done by the city of Newton for the project, um, which is, you know, under construction, at least the demolition is under construction, on Needham Street at the corner of, I think it's Oak Street, where the old piano factory is. That, that permit requires post-occupancy demand management. You know, they said there'd be a certain amount of vehicles. They said there'd be a certain amount of parking demand. Now it's occupied. Is that what we have here? So that then, if it doesn't work out the way they said it would, you have mitigation that you could apply later, even post-occupancy. Um, and, you know, I might be looking for something like that. As, you know, we're going to be talking about the, the uh, traffic and the parking at a subsequent hearing. But I want to really um, make sure we have a very strong uh, transportation demand management plan. Um, oh, and I just have a question. Uh, who knows? Is TV Place a public way? Or is it a private way? Lee, do you have an answer to that? I believe it's a public way. Can you say that a little louder? I'm sorry, it's hard to hear. I believe it is a public way. Thank you. You believe it is a public way, but okay. I, I, but, I, but, but, always, but Jean, I, I really, um, I, I, I want to check the assessor's maps and I don't have immediate access to them, but I can get you an answer. Okay, because I was thinking again of those trucks coming in, they should come in TV place and go down and have a different approach uh, for the, uh, the doors for, um, for their loading and unloading. All right, those are my questions and comments. Thank you. And I, I thought I would take the time to put them out because I wanted to see them answered the next time we are together. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have an, uh, a number of comments and questions uh, myself. Some of these you may address um, uh, through the subsequent hearing or you may have answers to, uh, uh, to now. Um, the uh, one thing for the board, the application in, in uh, Mr. Sullivan's letter to us from April 5 talks about uh, requesting an allowance for um, uh, the square footage allocation internally uh, of uses and for the floor plans not to require further planning board review or approval provided the parking requirements don't change. So that'll be something that we'll have to, you know, uh, to, uh, to consider. I, um, I understand the request, and I'm sure Lee can speak to our history on that. I don't know if we need to establish some kind of standard if the, if the floor plans change by 25% that have some additional impact elsewhere that we may have to review it, but uh, I certainly understand the request and we'll look into that. Uh, and it's something that we'll you know, consider for a decision as well as um, I understand that you're looking for allowance to um, uh, to be able to complete the project in phases um, uh, with a certificate of occupancy being available for one building and not necessarily for both buildings at the same time if one building's not finished and you're ab otherwise able, I guess, to tenant it up. Um, uh, so that's something that, you know, for the board that we'll have to consider, uh, you know, um, in the short months ahead. Um, I note that uh, the town manager's letter from April 26 to the state in response to uh, the applicant's ENF mentions improvements on Gould Street to accommodate increased uh, traffic, as does uh, Mr. Sullivan, your letter from um, uh, April uh, 5 on page 14. Um, the, and, and this really comes up with respect to the setback at, um, at Gould Street. So. One question that I have for now is, um, is your, and this may be for your engineers, uh, is your setback for Gould Street and Highland Avenue measured from the current layout of Gould Street and Highland Avenue? Do you have the ready answer to that or? Sure. Right, yeah, I can answer that. Great. Um, it is measured from the current lot line. Yeah, oh, sorry, Eric. <laughs> Yes, from the current lot line. Yeah, I was just going to say that, 
he used the, the zoning uh, documents that were part of the rezoning and showed a diagram for the setback taken from the property line. We used that information to set the setback dimension. Thank you, Eric, and thank you, Tim. Um, I presume that you'll discuss with our town engineer and town council uh, whether and how this site plan may need to be further modified to be measured from what would become the new layout of Gould Street yep. and any impact that would have. Um, so I'd like to see for our next hearing in July some progress on that or resolution on that question. Sure. Um, uh, I'm just quickly going through my list. Um, I know that Natasha had, had a comment or question. We're going to uh, yeah. wait for her. Um, in terms of uh, the lighting, what time do you anticipate the lights inside the buildings and the garage to um, turn off? I think Robert can probably speak to that best. Robert, do you have that detail at this time? Sure. So first of all, there's an energy management system that controls lighting. Lighting is based on occupancy sensors and motion, as well as sound. So basically office hours will be between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. So automatically when someone leaves their office, whether it's 4 p.m. or 7 p.m. Or, or 8 p.m., the lights will go off 15 minutes later. If they don't go off because of a motion failure or motion uh, complexity or vacuum cleaner, they have a safety fail mechanism that automatically sweeps all of the lighting modules and shuts them off at 11 p.m. no matter what. Thank and you. We can program, and we can program that time and adjust it whether it's 11 or 10, but we, we want to be overly sensitive to uh, neighbors so they're not seeing lights. I'm sure it was awkward for the neighbors all those years that Muzzy had the tall 50-foot light poles with the floodlights blaring on the cars for sale. Thank you. Um, it's a little hard to hear, I apologize. Uh, would any lights remain on overnight, either on the, uh, at the exterior or interior? No, sir, absolutely not. There would be okay. no lights on at night within the office buildings. There would be minimal light on inside the garage. That light would be set at 10% for light safety reasons, and those light safety reasons would allow uh, egress illumination for the stairwells and emergency access rooms. Thank you very much. Uh, in, um, in the letter that we received at the time as of April 5, uh, the proposal uh, suggested a lead silver status, but from the presentation today we see that, um, that you're looking to achieve gold. Are you committed to the gold standard? Yes, sir. Bullfinch's commitment is for ES and G at minimum gold level. Excellent. Thank you. Um, there were some questions about uh, um, that I had about environmental impacts. On page 16 of uh, uh, Mr. Sullivan's letter, it speaks about developing appropriate strategies combating climate change. Um, I'd like to see for the next hearing uh, an itemized list of what those strategies include. Um, and I, I believe you've suggested including a solar canopy of some kind on top of the, um, on top of the external parking garage. I don't know if that increases the height and if that requires any additional requirements from within us. Lee, do you know if if that exceeds the height, how to, ha uh, how to handle that, or that maybe that be something we can look into? It's certainly a goal we'll that we'd like to achieve. I think we'll have to review that with the building inspector. Okay. But it certainly would laud the goal, and it's something that we would like to achieve. Uh, um, Natasha, welcome, by the way. Oh, I'll, I'll come to you momentarily. I'm almost done. Um, there is some detail in the original plans of uh, March 30th that uh, reflect the impact of parking and the calculation of, I believe it's 1,408 spaces, relates to a ratio of 1 to 300, yet 
there may be an opportunity to reduce that parking further if there is a tenant that occupies, I believe, more than 50,000 square feet of space. Um, what I'd like to see, in particular because we're speaking about parking and traffic at our next hearing, is uh, what the net total would be. Uh, if it would be further reduced from 1408, would it be 1355? And what impact that would have, for instance, is there a potential to reduce one of the levels of the structured parking um, and what impact that could be? Or there may be other benefits by removing some parking uh, on the surface at the, uh, in front of the buildings. Um, I have uh, other comments and questions as relates to uh, parking and traffic, but I'm going to put a pin in it uh, and pick that pin up again or take it out uh, next uh, time. And at this point, Natasha, I'd like to recognize you. Thank you. Um, so the first thing I want to say is that I've been pretty impressed with the uh, community outreach and in general the way that the project has developed uh, and continues to develop. So really impressed with it and um, all the changes that have been made, including the scale on um, Highland Avenue and, and, the, uh, and the, the corner kind of uh, condition. And then also uh, the, the green amenities that are happening on Gould Street. So I think it's uh, continuing to develop and it's, to me, a it, it, you know, significant amount of development. Um, so my, my, my comments are more for the development as it continues to develop. And so um, the first one is uh, just in general that this this project is next to a residential area, so being sent and hearing from the community also is really important, as some of you also mentioned. But from my observations, um, the scale of the building um, is much better on Highland Avenue, but the scale of the building off of Gould Street is still pretty large. So as you develop the building, understanding. Um, not only the materials, the GFRC, but the opportunities with the glazing to break it down a little bit so that the scale is appropriate to the residential neighborhood that it lies in and is respectful of it. The same with the parking garage understanding. I know that you have some uh, metal on the main part and then you have some, just understanding the development of that and the opportunities for that to make sure that we're really sensitive to the community to me is really important. Um, I share a little bit of Gene's concerned with the loading. I understand that you reduce the loading, which is really admirable for this type of a building. Uh, the one that concerns me is the one that's right next to um, the driveway, and then making sure that we, you know, the other one is screened well enough so that it's not these, you know, um, gaping holes. But I understand that there are constraints on the site, so um, just the development of that would be really good to see. Um, the one question that I have is. You're creating this green belt across the site, and then, but I know that there's a little site across from TV, what's it called, TV? Um, TV Place. TV yes. Place, I was gonna call it TV Way. Retention phone areas. And that um, would be good to connect it because doesn't it also connect over to kind of the, the rail trail or whatever that would be in the future? If there's an opportunity of having some kind of connection, I'm on looking at page four above the little building. Um, any improvement to kind of connect it to make a larger green belt would be, I think, advent advantageous. Um, let me see what else. The, the sustainability goals are great. Just, you know, push them as much as you can because I think that this, this is going to be a really key project for, for Needham and it's a gateway to Needham and having a really sustainable building as much as we can would be great. Um, one thing that when um, we looked at the transportation and the bus lines in as you were talking about other ways of dealing with transportation. Um, the MBTA bus line doesn't go through that area, which is kind of a shame. It goes, I can't remember exactly, but. Central Ave to okay. Central Right, but it cuts across from Highland. It cuts across, and I think it's, uh, I, I, don't, I don't remember when, but it doesn't hit. There could be an opportunity to be able to bring, uh, you know, transportation to that area to alleviate and, and to give opportunity for people to take the train and then be able to get over there. And um, the, the, the other two things are minor. One is, uh, but, but major in the grand scheme of things, is acoustics, especially all the units uh, that are on top of the buildings, especially the ones on Highland across from the way, which I know you're going to work on anyway. But, and then the signage. I think it's really great that there's all this retail and restaurant. But I, I was, when I was looking at it, the signage was all different. Thinking about, I don't know if we have the plan, if, if um, 
the guidelines, uh, the zoning guidelines have anything about signage, but making it so that it's uh, more deliberate. I, I think just on that one point, yeah. whatever is in here is really for architecture and illustrative purposes. These okay. aren't specific signs yet, so. No, no, I know. Yeah, but those, just but keep it in mind, like as you're thinking about it, just because the 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 the, the building next to the residential neighborhood keeping that same quality and then making it so that it, um, it's appropriate for that corner. Okay. So. That's it uh, for now. Yeah, for, yeah. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, I um, yes. just wanted to, um, I was, I was able to pull the assessor's map and check the status of TV place and it is, it's in a private way. So, um, that's what the status of that way is. So Gene, did you hear that? Uh, he was saying that TV place is a private way, not it's a public a private way. way. Okay. It probably doesn't make any difference, but it could, you know, depending on who has rights and so forth. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the question, and uh, uh, Lee, thank you very much for the research. Um, uh, I want to just make sure that I have my papers organized because we still have a number of things to continue with. Can I just ask a, a, a quick question? Yes. Because Natasha raised a point that brought something to mind, which is, that small section of land that's on the other side of um, um, uh, the TV place. Yep, yep, the other side of TV place. My recollection now from from the zoning amendment is that that parcel is actually part of the Muzzy site, not part of the Channel Five site. And so I'm wondering. Um, I don't see that parcel being part of this development, and wondering uh, whether. Um, uh, 557 Highland LLC owns that parcel. I assume it does, um, and what the plans are for that for that small parcel. Yeah, I don't know, Eric, if you're able to pull that up on a plan. We do own it. It is not part of the uh, application. Well, if we're talking about the same one, do we know how large that piece of land is? That's it roughly it's small. Land. I think it's yeah. a less than 6,000 6, square feet. feet. 7,000. 7,000 square feet. Yes, sir. Thank you. 7,000 square feet of land. And you're saying at this time there's no plan to develop that? That's correct. It's a very small piece of land. Uh, it abuts directly to Channel 5's building. Is it vacant now or is there a building on it? No, sir. Fully occupied by Hearst Communications uh, in the Channel 5, basically. Okay. And you, and you plan to keep it that way for the time being? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Anything else, Paul? No, I'm all set. Thanks. Uh, unless any other members of the um, uh, planning board have something else to say, I'd, I'd like to uh, just briefly summarize the comments that we've received from uh, town departments. Uh, from our fire department by email on June the 1st from Chief Condon, um, uh, he speaks to continuing to work with the developer to ensure that all codes and safety regulations are met. He notes the developer uh, will clear the fitness path from snow around the perimeter to ensure that public safety uh, vehicles have access during the winter. Um, and Gene, you had a question about uh, public safety access. It seems like what they were proposing, although we'll get into the details of this not tonight, perhaps at our next hearing, that they've developed it in such a way or they intend to develop it in such a way that the fire department, uh, the police department and other emergency vehicles will have full access around the whole perimeter of the building. That's what I understood they were seeking, yes. Okay. Uh, that is the case. That is how it's designed, yeah. Okay. And, uh, and uh, a further note from Chief Condon that uh, he'll continue to ensure compliance throughout the development from our fire department uh, from Chief Schlittler, we have an email on June the 3rd uh, who suggests that measures perhaps including signage to restrict through traffic in the nearby residential neighborhood during peak hours may be, uh, you know, should be something that we ought to consider uh, and also to consider measures to reduce traffic impacts from Hunting and Greendale and to ensure that public access by safety vehicles are, are, uh, is possible at all times around the entire project, which you've just confirmed will be the case. From our building commissioner, David Roach, by letter dated May the 25th, 
Uh, he makes a comment that he has met and is continuing, continuing to meet with the developer on the existing and developing plans to ensure compliance. From Tom Ryder, our town engineer, by letter dated June the 2nd, uh, he is seeking clarification on the water supply and wastewater calculations and on the measurements from the new, what would become the new right-of-way that I was discussing, uh, uh, the new right-of-way layout on Gould Street. Uh, and um, he also has the standard, uh, rem uh, um, how do I pronounce this, Paul, the, the NIPTES? Uh, re yes. NIPTES requirement to produce a letter to the town identifying what measures the applicant uh, will select and the dates by which those measures will be completed. Uh, so we can incorporate in our decision. Uh, from our health uh, department by uh, assistant uh, uh, director Tara Gurge on, uh, by email on May the 27th, noting that any food establishments will of course require a food permit plan and design uh, plan review and approval by the health department. I apologize if I'm popping the microphone. Uh, tr uh, that trash and recycling dumpsters to be in close proximity. She refers specifically to the requirement of being in the parking lot, but it seems from the site plan uh, that you've presented that all the dumpsters are actually inside the building. That's correct. Uh, so That's correct. They're, they're required to be inside the building to comply with LEED. Ah, so that's uh, something. No, no outside storage. Good. No so outside storage of trash. Is Thank you. Um, that's something we just want to make sure that uh, the health department is, you know, is aware of. And, and a grease trap, she's also suggesting, which I see in the site plan that you've included it as part of the engineering schemes, um, uh, that the wastewater reuse proposal will require mass DEP approval uh, and uh, that some sort of biohazardous waste containment will need to be on site. Um, and recommends that the developer to continue to work with uh, McPhail and Associates as licensed uh, um, site professionals to continue to, uh, the work and to provide and to continue to, to continue to provide the Department of Health with uh, updated cleanup reports. From our design review board by memo dated May the 16th, 2022. Uh, uh, they have asked the developer to provide a more detailed landscape plan and to include more native species. Uh, and they have agreed um, that the right size of tree plantings are three and a half or four inch calipers. Uh, they've requested a variety of grasses, planting more, uh, uh, more uh, planting beds. So it's broken up and it's not just one lawn and it clearly by the designs that you presented today, that's a change. Uh, they've suggested some additional screening along the Highland Avenue walk path and along the plaza space. Um, uh, they, they also, the design review board looked also at the uh, site lighting for pedestrian and parking areas. They'd like to see the final selections. Uh, the proposed lighting, they say, should mitigate off-site visibility. Um, uh, they have approved the building and design and massing. Uh, they've suggested lighter colors on the mechanical screening right now. If you see uh, from the presentation that we saw tonight and from the March 30 plans, um, there is a, both, they're both the top of the building and the mechanical screenings of a dark color. And to, uh, they're suggesting to break that up with a lighter color for the mechanical screens. Uh, and suggest they have a comment about the, uh, uh, the detail of the garage doors. And with respect to the parking garage itself, they've recommended varying heights and shapes for the screening material, in particular on the Gould Street side. I thought that was interesting. And uh, finally, um, uh, from the president and founder of the Bay Colony Rail Trail Association by letter dated May 17, They've advocated that the petitioner commit to developing the MBTA right-of-way on the northern part of the uh, Highway Commercial One District to connect it to Needham Heights. I saw that there was reference in, I believe, in your, in your letter uh, that said that you'd agree to study it. Uh, and uh, this organization has already acknowledged that funds exist for a study. I think that there, um, and uh, and so they're looking for a commitment to actually develop that. So 
that may come up as part. Um, at this time, I'd like to ask members of the public who have comments this, uh, this I'd like to thank the members of the public who have already addressed comments. We've received, I believe, 34 comments. These comments were received uh, after town staff was able to prepare the packet for tonight. So rest assured, we will, uh, we will read those. We encourage any member, particularly uh, who has, uh, wants to comment on several items or who uh, may like to speak at length on one particular item, please feel free to continue to email us. We do read thoroughly. They have just as much of an impact as comments by uh, people pres uh, here by, uh, uh, personally or by Zoom. And if I'm not mistaken, Alex, I'm going to put you on the spot here. I believe that the ad email address is planning at needhamma.gov. All right, so I have that correct. Good. Um, I, the planning department, as I, as I mentioned, has received 34 comments. Um, I, as we open the public comment, we want to remind everyone that this is the first of several hearings on this subject matter. Again, we anticipate focusing on traffic and parking at our next hearing on July the 7th. We may have a third session, perhaps sometime in September, that will continue any unresolved items from tonight as well as from our July 7 meeting. And we will continue to post updates with our plans for additional uh, continuances of this hearing, different sessions of this hearing uh, on our website. In an effort to hear from as many people as possible and to ensure an accurate record, whether by Zoom or here in person in the room, when called upon, we ask you to clearly state your name and your address um, and uh, to address your remarks to the chair and to limit your comments to three minutes. If you agree with someone that um, uh, that has said something and you agree with that, it's just as impactful to us if you say, I agree with the previous speaker, um, and not to repeat the exact same comment, just because, again, we're trying to get through as many people as possible. Uh, in general, we won't answer questions as they come up tonight, but we will note them, and we will ask staff or others to respond to those questions once everyone has had a chance to speak. Um, and I intend to alternate between people on Zoom and people in the room. And with that, um, I'd like to take the opportunity to open this up to public comment. We have a microphone here. The chair recognizes Lois Sockel. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. This won't take three minutes. I have but one question. I, and the question I have has to do with the levels of the, uh, the labs. All right, I noticed on number 10, when they were listed, that there will be no lab built uh, above level two, which would eliminate level three, which is airborne viruses, something good to eliminate. What I wanna know, is that binding for renting space or leasing part of another lab? Is that a binding statement that there will be no th level three anywhere on the property? That's what they're committing to, and in our decision, it would reflect that. So if they have a, you know, they would not be able to lease out uh, space to um, uh, bio safety lab three or four. Okay, then I can go home and feel safe for the kids in the area, for the area, and for Needham. Thank you very much. Thank you for your question. I'd like to go to uh, Zoom. We have one person with their hand up. Joni, uh, if you could state your uh, name and address for the record, please. Thank you. Hi, Joni Shockett, 174, 174 Evelyn Road in Needham. Um, I have a question for Bullfinch. The new design 
is there a square foot difference between the new designed building and the old designed building? No. They're exactly the same? Yes. Okay, and one other question. Is there a possibility of building a second level of parking underground in each of the two areas for underground parking, which could eliminate one or two stories of the parking garage? We don't believe so at this time based on environmental conditions. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to look to the room. Uh, Marianne Cooley, the chair recognizes Marianne. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Marianne Cooley, 85 High Street. Um, I have sort of a general question, and, and it may have been at the beginning, although I don't think I heard it. I'm wondering about minority and women-owned business participation in the project, just how you think about that in the project as a whole, and are there any commitments that your business typically makes about um, engaging those kinds of businesses in the overall project. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Schlager. Mr. Schlager, are you able to respond? We may have to follow up on that. I'm not sure. Oh, I, I can. Alec demoted me from uh, speaking uh, ability to uh, uh, non-speaking ability. Thank you, Alex. Uh, I didn't hear the question, Mr. Chairman. Could you repeat it, please? Sure. The, qu the question was, um, uh, uh, to what extent are you working with uh, female and minority-owned businesses throughout this development process? The answer is we will, as a company, our ESG goals are strictly adhered to, constantly monitored, and we do follow uh, such goals and will do so. We have not begun any marketing efforts as of yet. Uh, we have not assigned a real estate broker or selected a real estate broker for marketing the project. Do you have a follow-up question? And within the project itself. With regard to leasing, construction? Construction, management, design, all of the elements involved in producing the project. Yes, we are committed to ESG goals and objectives with respect to diversity. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'd like to turn back to Zoom at this time um, to see if we have anyone with their hand up and it uh, we're doing a quick scan. I don't think we see anyone, Alex. Do you see anyone? Neither do I. Uh, the chair, before I come to you, sir, there was another gentleman here in the front row. Your question satisfied? Did you? Uh, okay. You, 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 were, you were first. I. Exactly. <laughs> Hello, Ben Daniels. Um, I live at 5 Sacha Road directly across Highland Ave from the project. So obviously we have some interest in what goes there. And I'm curious if anybody knows, how tall is a TripAdvisor building, for just for comparison, or the TripAdvisor parking garage? I'm just asking that for like a comparative heights to understand how tall a 70 foot or a 50 foot building actually looks. Ooh, uh, so the TripAdvisor said two additional stories. I believe their uh, trip advisors is a six-story building and the parking garage is also a six-level parking garage. So that, Sorry, you remember exactly? are they like 70 feet? I'm just curious if we know foot-wise. I, I believe it's 80, 85, 85 feet. Okay. And yes. it's 98 to the feet. Hoping that this doesn't look like trip advisor directly across the street. Um, one other question, and I know you're going to get to the parking later, and I don't want to sound negative with what I'm about to say, but what I heard tonight sounded a lot of parking, I mean, not parking or traffic fantasy land. People aren't going to be taking bicycles, and maybe a few people will, but I'll say that nobody at this front table who's dressed like this is taking a bicycle to come to this meeting. You rode tonight? Not to this meeting, but to other meetings, yes. I understand, but someone's coming in a suit and tie, they're not likely taking a bicycle unless they have somewhere to change. Um, 
we live in New England, not San Diego. We have snow and ice four months a year. And I know how much traffic we already get cutting through on Sachem Road. You know, we're, we're a private road that we're responsible for maintaining, yet we have hundreds of cars cutting through between public roads every day. And on the other side where Mill and Utica are, I mean, I see lots and lots and lots of cars cutting through there. I understand some of this may be putting up the flashing signs and saying for residents only, but I'm, I'm kind of hoping that when we hear about the parking in a month, whenever that, that meeting is, I hear something that sounds a little more well thought through than what I've heard tonight, because the bicycles and bicycle repair rooms and bicycle lanes, just go to the Needham and see who uses the bicycle lanes. The bicyclists don't, they're riding in a pack of four all the way across the, the middle of the road. They don't even, I don't think some of them even realize there's bicycle lanes. And I walk quite a bit across the bridge at Kendrick and if you try riding up that bicycle lane when there's cars getting on 128, you're going to get killed. I can't tell you how many times I've been standing at the top of Kendrick at where the sign says yield to pedestrians with my dog and had a car s s sailing by at 60 miles an hour. It doesn't even see us. So I, I guess when I, so hopefully in a month, we're going to hear something very clever about how to reduce the parking. But 1,400 parking spaces seems like an awful lot. And the one last thing about the parking space is when it will be interesting to hear like what the turnover of those spaces are. If it's 1,400 cars, people park once a day and then leave, or if they're going to turn over five times a day, it really makes a big difference. So anyway, look forward to hearing in July 7th. Thank you very much. I'm going to go back to the uh, Zoom and see if we have anyone from Zoom with a hand up. Mr. Chair Mr. Chairman, um, yes. I would like to uh, raise a question that was um, raised by this gentleman. Uh, I don't expect an answer now, but it's a question for Lee Newman to get back to us on. Um, he mentions the question of cut through traffic. And um, Chief um, Slitler also raises that question at the other end of, of uh, uh, of the small roads um, off, off of Central Avenue and Gould. Um, my question for Lee Newman is, do we have the authority to do anything about that, or is that something for a different board in town to, to, to handle, whether it's the police department or the traffic advisory committee? or somebody else. I, 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 I just question whether, whether that's something that we can condition or not. Uh, thank you for the question. Lee, uh, if you could flag that, please, uh, so we can uh, review okay. that internally, and then uh, we'll be able to answer that. Thank you. Um, um, Mr. Chair, yes. may I also respond to Mr. Daniel's concern about the TripAdvisor building? Because I was thinking of that building earlier in our proceedings, because what, um, you know we granted the permits for that building, and our permits had some controls on how the lighting should be, how bright it should be. But it was terrible. You could see that lighting. You know, as soon as you went around 128, and you're coming anywhere near Needham, you'd see that lighting. Um, however, we complained. They turned the lighting down, and I think it has been satisfactory. So we want to make sure we have good controls in place and that they are enforced. Yeah. Thank you, Jean. Um, before I come to you, sir, I just want to go back. Alex, I don't see anyone else on Zoom with a hand up to you. Uh, so I'm going to come to uh, this gentleman uh, in the blue jacket, if you could state your name and address for the record, please. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, Rob Dangle, 28 Hewitt Circle. And uh, so uh, I've talked to a lot of residents in my neighborhood. We happen to be off of Noanet, and there's still a lot of concern. You know, I, I appreciate uh, Bullfinch's efforts to kind of make proposals on how they're going to mitigate cut through in Noanet. It's still a massive concern for that neighborhood uh, because people are cutting through it now. They're speeding down there. There's lots of little kids. So we just really need to have some compassion for the, the neighborhoods there and really be thoughtful how we. Um, just work towards mitigation. I mean, I obviously don't have that solution, and, and I appreciate Bullfinch's willingness to work with the neighborhood, but 
just make some consideration there. Um, also, a point of clarification, I've not been able to get real straight answers over the past few years, um, you know, when you guys were trying to rezone this. Uh, on Highland Ave, I know that's owned by the state. Um, it's an awfully narrow street, and I've not ever heard a proposal from anyone to take some land from, the, you know, we'll call it the Muzzy property, to widen Highland. And I know that the state controls Highland, but th there's really no proposal that I've seen that's made that intersection other than like widening Gould, but making Highland wider to accommodate the 500 plus cars that are going to come in and out of this site during peak rush hour. Um, so I, I just don't know if the board itself has talked to the state about doing anything with the improvements there, but uh, we don't really know what those improvements are. We can check with uh, uh, our town manager's office and uh, any discussions about that with Mass DOT. Uh, just some consideration with potentially widening it. And then um, I just want to throw out some kudos to, you know, all the members of, uh, of, of the Bullfinch team on the commitment to electric vehicles and photovoltaics. So thanks. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I do see that we have, I'm going to rotate between the room and Zoom. I know that rhymed. Uh, we have someone on Zoom uh, that we're going to bring over. And we'll be patient for a moment. Yes. Uh, hi. Hi. If you could state your name and uh, address for the record and ideally have video, please. Sure. Sorry about that. Uh, Karen Quigley, 22 Yale Road. Um, I just have a couple of questions. They don't need to be answered here, but things to, to consider. One, I'll start with a comment. I very much appreciated. Ms. McKnight's suggestion that there be some sort of post-occupancy checks that the assumptions that went into all of this planning and in fact turn out to be true and that there be some accountability for those, which uh, um, given how responsive Bullfinch has been so far, makes a lot of sense that they would also be open to those ideas. Um, one question, perhaps no answer right now, but I would love to know the answer. There was a there was an allusion to how impervious the site was while Muzzy was the occupant, and I would be, I would love to know how impervious the site is um, with the new plan as well, um, particularly given some flooding issues in some parts of Needham, and, and presumably the assumption is that there is less um, solid surface and, and greater ability to absorb water, uh, and I, it would be nice to know what that, what that improvement is, if it in fact is an improvement. And then I guess my final question is just wanting to know if there is uh, a plan beyond signage and a temporary police presence, presence for reducing cut through traffic. It's not clear to me that signage is necessarily going to be the optimal way to stop cut through traffic. As, as the other gentleman mentioned, it's happening now. It, it, it will only get worse. Uh, and, and it's not clear to me that signage was necessarily going to solve that problem um, so I would love to hear a little bit more about the the plans for how that how that will work thank you thank you very much um, I now like to recognize the gentleman in the gingham shirt I believe with the glasses Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, David Mindlin, I live at 74 Hampton Avenue. I agree with the three previous speakers about the cut through traffic. I'm on the opposite side from Sachem. Um, Hampton Avenue being all of a block long and paralleling Gould Street is already a nightmare as far as cut through traffic and traffic from the little industrial area that abuts us. Um, there are times when we back out of our driveways and take our lives in our hands. I, I really am not sure what kind of mitigation can be proposed to prevent that type of cut through traffic. Also, we face Mills Field and you see little kids running out from between cars. Uh, the playground is right there. The baseball field is right there. And if it gets any worse, there could possibly be a disaster there. So I think that really needs to be addressed because we'd be adding, let's say conservatively, a thousand cars to that area. Um, I also think the post uh, permitting mitigation is a phenomenal idea. 
because you just never know. And kudos to that suggestion. Thank you very much. Alex, um, I'm going to go back to the room, uh, back to Zoom. I don't see anyone with their hand up at this time. Uh, oh, we do have one. All right. My name is Maggie Flanagan, and I'm at 54 Sachem. Uh, and my question is, um, at the beginning, there was talk about the lights going off at uh, you know 7 p.m. or the end of the workday. Um, but my worry as a neighborhood, um, if you're going to put in restaurants or retail, uh, those obviously won't go off at 7 p.m. Um, so with, just to be concerned about uh, the lights, the signing signage on the on the restaurants, the signage on the retail, um, and what time, you know, that those things would be cut off. Um, obviously, retail usually is nine o'clock. Restaurants go from nine to eleven, or so on. So I guess that would be one of my as they face directly to a neighborhood. Um, so that would be one of my concerns. If you can speak to that, and then um, the other thing is just the to don't go through the neighborhoods. I live where Mills and Utica and Sachem and people cut through. And I think this, the idea of putting the signs of the don't go through um, is a good idea. My worry is that maybe the neighborhood might be okay, but me getting out of my neighborhood um, is gonna be the real challenge. So we're gonna go on to hunting um, and the hunting Gould Highland um, is going to be so you can put those signs up, but you know, getting out of the neighborhood is going to be triple beyond hard to get out of the neighborhood if those that intersection is worse than it is now. So, but the first the first one about the lights um, for retail and restaurant is my real concern. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the chair recognizes the woman with the glasses. Just put them on the top of your head. Thank you, chair. I'm Holly Charbonnier, 94 Sachem Road. My biggest concern about this project is just the density of it. Uh, when we were first looking at the rezoning last year, there was um, a bunch of us that were trying to push for a lower FAR 1.0. At that time and now again, I didn't realize that parking's not even included in the FAR. So when I look at this proposal, of over 500,000 square feet of office and biolab space, plus an additional 600,000 square feet of parking, we're looking at 1.1 million square feet of development in a partially residential neighborhood. You have the discretion, the ability to make this project smaller I understand that everyone in town is looking to maximize the tax revenue, but at what cost? Based on their Bullfinch's MEPA submission, at the current size and scope, this project is projected to bring a total of 5,890 car trips a day. Where I live on Sachem, when I try and get out right now, it's nearly impossible. Everybody's racing for the red light blocking the roads on the side, not wanting to let a single car go. You find that you're racing to get up there when there is a break because you know once that light turns green, they're all gonna fly down and try and take you out. If we add an additional 550 cars an hour, a total of 5,890 a day, that's going to be significantly worse when parents are trying to get to soccer fields when you just want to go to the grocery store. I do appreciate the efforts that Bullfinch has made with sustainability and resiliency design, with the landscape design, the offer to help with sidewalks and family-friendly bike paths. I just want to take a look at this and see if we can make it a little smaller. It feels massive. and. This is the gateway to Needham. It speaks to who we are as Needham. I just feel like the one argument I keep hearing is, well, it looks better than a car dealership. 
we can do better than looking better than a car dealership. Let's raise the bar a little and think about size and density and the walkability and the safety for families. It's Needham. This means a lot. It's going to change the future of our town for years to come. If it could just be a little bit smaller is all I'm asking. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have any other comments on Zoom? I don't see any, Alex. Anyone else in the room? Yes. Um, hi, and thank you all for uh, your efforts on this project. My name is Emily Pick. I live at 12 Mills Road. Um, and so that I'm not repetitive, I want to echo the comments of Ben and Holly um, concerning um, traffic and density of this project. Um, I live at the very top of 12 Mills Road, and in fact, our home is one of the oldest um, in that neighborhood. It was built in 1915, and in fact, I could see our house on one of those maps shown in the beginning of the meeting. But my biggest, biggest concern with this whole project is traffic. And I'm eager to attend the meeting. I believe it's now scheduled for July 7th. But getting out of Mills Road onto Highland Avenue, regardless of the time of day, whether it's at 7.30 in the morning, 5 o'clock at night, or even 2 o'clock on a Tuesday Sunday afternoon, is nearly impossible. And um, Jean, I believe you suggested post-project um, post mitigation efforts so that once this building is built, whatever it's going to be, that traffic for the long term is very carefully monitored in the cut through streets, um, including Noah Net and Yale area, um, including Mills, uh, Sacum, and Utica. Because traffic for the long term, it, it, it's hard to project. Um, the 5,000 trips a day are terrifying to us at the top of Mills Road. There are approximately 30 young children that have moved into our neighborhood in the past three years, um, and I'm very proud of that. We have a great neighborhood, but traffic is the biggest concern with this project. So in addition to scaling back the FAR, um, scaling back the retail, considering the hours of the retail, the nature of the, of the businesses that go in there, I'm relieved to see that there's no uh, bars um, or, or pubs planned at this point, but again, traffic, noise and respect for the residential neighborhood needs to be factored in. So thank you very much for, for all of the thought. Um, that's my feedback. Thank you. Thank you very much. Alex, I don't see anyone on Zoom. No. Anyone in the room have any other comment? Yes, Mr. Fox. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Doug Fox, uh, Mark Tree Road. Um, I want to, just a procedural thing, I know we have a real hard time getting feedback from residents about any of this stuff, and holding a public hearing where the public has to wait an hour and 40 minutes to speak, I think we should think about how we can make that more efficient for residents. You know, I, I think we all want to hear from them, and that is a lot, you know, especially for those of us who sat through the previous videos and presentations, it, there's a lot of duplication in that. Um, I, I, what you're proposing is beautiful. Um, anything is better than what was there. I think we've moved past what was there. Um, and I, I don't think this should just be a little bit smaller. I look at the as of right floor area ratio that what you proposed is almost 80% larger. Like, and what are we getting for that? Pickleball courts? a walking path, um, maybe some traffic improvements that might offset the size of what's going in there. Um, I don't see a real need or benefit to residents in more office space or lab space. Uh, there's a ton of conversion to lab space right now. I think that's another bubble. So I don't really see the great benefit for what we're getting for that added 80% floor area ratio. So I would say let's just start at that 0.70 what can be built for that? And if they're going beyond that, we should get a lot for it. Because, uh, and I live very far from it, but my residents are still very concerned about the traffic implications from doing something this large. For what benefit you're going to get, and I think we talked 
um, earlier in the previous zoning, if it was residential, if it was senior housing, if it was things people, affordable housing, things people would want. But this isn't something I think residents are clamoring for. We're all we're going to get more tax revenue just from how much more this sold for. So how, what are we going to get for that added tax revenue? And I, I would urge you to really think a lot smaller. Thank you. Thank you. Alex, I don't think I see a hand up. Uh, so anyone else in the room? Yes. The orange sweater and gray hat. I am uh, Deb Whitney. I live at 36 Hunting Road, which is on the corner of Hunting and Sachem on the southeast side. And I just wanted to make a couple comments. Um, I really do want to start off by saying thank you to the Bullfinch Group. I appreciate all of the, the public meetings that you've held to get feedback. That has been a great process, and I really appreciate the openness and willingness to make changes along the way. Um, my main concerns about the project are the size, as previous speakers have spoken to. I think going from 0.7 to 1.25, 1.3 seems like a substantial change, and we should, if we're going to go that high, which I don't feel like we need to, we should be getting more in return. That's going to benefit the immediate neighbors. Um, I also am concerned about my neighbors, um, like the previous speaker over here, who will be overlooking directly across the street from that new building. What are they gonna look at? Three-story tall building with HVAC equipment on top. What will that look like? What will that look like from a noise and sound, uh, from, a, from a noise and light pollution perspective? There have been other buildings uh, expanded or built uh, in the area fairly recently that have caused significant light pollution and impacted neighbors. So I'm concerned about additional light and noise pollution that will affect us. Um, and my primary concern is the traffic. So I live on the east side of Hunting Road. It is very hard to get across hunting unless it's a very off hour. Uh, almost every year I need to call the school transportation department to ask them to bring the bus across to the east side of hunting so I don't have to send my kids across in the dark in the wintertime to cross Hunting Road. It's very dangerous. People race up to the green light to try to make it through. Um, and it's just, it's, you kind of take your life in your hands. There are, as you know, there's Mills Field, there's the tennis courts, baseball field, the playground um, on the other side of, uh, Hunt, of Highland Avenue on the north side. I do send my kids out biking, and I kind of feel like they're taking their life in their hands trying to get through the intersection. I want them to have that freedom, but it's very dangerous. And I think the improvements will make a difference, but I am concerned about the additional car traffic going to and leaving this potential uh, site. Um, and uh, my property where it's located, and I've expressed this concern in other meetings and, and more recently with the Bullfinch meeting, is that I get a lot of turnarounders in our street, in my driveway, in my neighbor's driveways. Sometimes I can't get into my driveway because people are turning around. And so I'm concerned that there will be additional outflow from the new site that will cause people to, instead of getting on the highway, come down hunting, potentially pull a U-turn onto Satrum or other surrounding streets to try to get back out to make, make the light through. I've seen overturned cars, they've taken out fire hydrants. It's just a very busy, there's cut-throughs, as other speakers have mentioned, and I am concerned about the size of the project, the number of new car trips, additional car trips, and the impact that it will have in kind of further isolating some of these neighborhoods. Um, my neighborhood, I feel somewhat isolated from getting across hunting because of the traffic concerns. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Anyone else in the room? Any additional comments or questions? Yes, the hand up. My name is Ashley Shifley. I live at 52 Greendale, which Google Maps tells me is 1,200 feet away from 557 Highland Avenue. Thank you for your time tonight. Thank you to Bullfinch for um, the community meetings that, that they've put on so far. It's helped us learn a lot about the project. Um, so we're here tonight, I think, in part because the applicant isn't entitled to a special permit. 
the board has discretion to deny a special permit. And in evaluating this application, there are certain findings that the board has to make. And one of those is whether the proposed and existing infrastructure can support the demand that the new project and existing conditions are going to place on it. And I think it's critical in that analysis to consider pedestrians and bicyclists. The nearby neighborhoods are going to bear the brunt of the traffic conditions that most people have spoken about tonight. The construction noise, both during and after construction, the nearby residents are going to bear the brunt of that. So let's make sure that they can meaningfully access the amenities that Bullfinch is proposing, as well as other amenities up and down Gould Street, including the tennis courts and all the way up to Elliott. You know, kids, go to Elliott walking down, the, down Gould Street and go to Elliott. We need to make sure that there are adequate sidewalks. I'd like um, Bullfinch to consider, and maybe I missed it, but I'd like Bullfinch to consider continuing the raised bike paths from Highland down through the extent of its, gold, it, its road work on Gould Street. I think that that would make family-friendly um, pedestrian and bicycle accommodations that not just a commuter bicyclist can use, but that families can use. Another finding that the planning board has to make if it wants to grant this special permit is that it, this project is compatible with surrounding neighborhoods. And as several people have pointed out tonight, this site is sort of surrounded on several sides by really vibrant residential communities. Um, what would make this project more compatible with those communities? Protected bike lanes are one thing that I've already mentioned, but additional green space, park space. I think someone mentioned the unused rail bed um, from Gould Street to 128. That would be a great start. Why not consider making a connection between the nature trail that Bullfinch has proposed and that section for a pocket park, right? We could create, we could do some of the creative permitting that I believe you, Ms. McKnight, um, mentioned on the other side of, of 128 that they did in Newton with the Northland project. I echo the support for post-occupancy traffic demand management requirements. I think that's an excellent idea. Um, but we can get creative with this permitting process and why not make this more compatible than it is now with nearby residential uses? And the Heights is being paved over at an alarmingly high rate. As a longtime resident, I've been there since 2009 now, so much of this has turned into pavement, even since I moved here. Um, and it, it's really, it's concerning for residents um, and I'd like to see more green space as a part of this. I'd like to see us get, get creative with this. This is going to be a landmark project for Needham. So let's get this one right. Um, let's make it compatible with residential uses. And the, the last couple things um, I wanna say are that the, the restaurant and retail uses, I'd really like the board to listen to the neighbors on that in terms of hours of operation and type of establishment that goes in there. Um, I think those could potentially be an amenity for the community, but only if they're open so that the community can use them. I personally wouldn't like to see something that's only open between 11 and 2 for the workers in those buildings, because the community can't really use those amenities. So I'd, I'd, I'd want the community heard on that. And then lastly, um, I'm relying as a citizen on the planning board to incorporate the promises that, the, that Bullfinch has made so far, pickleball courts, nature trail, other amenities, into the special permit so that we have an enforcement mechanism. You know, I'm, I'm sure they're lovely people, but I, I would like it incorporated into the special permit, particularly the BSL-2 designation, without any BSL-3 cabinet or container. No BSL-3 use whatsoever. Thank you. Thank you very much. Comments. I'm going to turn back to um, 
zoom and with a quick scroll I don't see anyone so I'm going to return back to the room does anyone else have anything else to say yeah, Mr. Chair if there's no one else here I'd like to I'd like to speak now since I held off for the public um, so just a few few comments in mind uh, one is um, um, echoing what the design review board said about the screening at the top of the building to keep it and make it so it blends in a little bit more so that way the building will not look as high. Uh, questions about the EV charging. Um, I, right, now, right now I can't really tell if the EV charging is only going to be within the parking structure itself. So I'd like to get some clarity as far as where the EV charging is going to be. Is it only going to be level two or will there also be some level three? So I'd like some clarity on that. Um, uh, I wouldn't mind, uh, Mr. Schlager, if I uh, get some clarity now. Do you have anything? Do you have any? Do you have any locations of outside of the parking garage where there will be some AV charging, if any, if any, outside the parking garage right now? We do, sir. There are approximately twenty-five percent of each designated area will be uh, equipped with a level two charger. There will be uh, a dozen or so level three chargers scattered equally between the outdoor parking, the main central garage parking, and then each of the lower level parking uh, under building south and building north. However, with all of that said, sir, we are at least four years away at best uh, from completion of construction, uh, completion of tenant build out, completion of occupancy. And I would suspect within the next five years, if not sooner, there will be new technology and improved technology. So there may very well be a level four charging system or some other type of, of faster uh, charging system to allow for quick charge. As or, technology or perhaps even some induction charging. And or induction charging. Induction sure, charging. Absolutely you you just drive over it and you're done. Um, one, other, one other question is, and I know there's going to be an infiltration within the property itself. What about um, within the roadway, the driveway leading up to it? What, what is there to mitigate that water flow itself so it's not leaving the property? Uh, each of the entire uh, drive aisles will be equipped with an infiltration system that will capture solids, uh, grease traps, uh, sand oil gas traps and the like and the two detention bases if you'd like we can share screen and screens and I can put it back up the uh, detention area Eric do you want to pull it up real quick the detention area that we have designated with the overlook bridge the wooden footbridge as you transfer uh, over on the north uh, east corner can go to the, the elevation Eric that shows it a little better uh, on, on the north, north side Yep. So you zoom in there on the on the upper right hand corner. It says pond. That's the detention bridge with the lookout. Uh, the detention pond with the lookout bridge, and that's just a footbridge for people to walk over. Elevated about three feet above the the water level. Thank thank you. Um, and I I want to echo what has been stated by the public here, whether it be Zoom or perhaps mostly in person here, and that is that uh, I think there needs to be. I do believe there needs to be more green space. Um, this, for personally, for myself, there's truly not enough. I mean, we're, we are losing it left and right. Now, I mean, we, we don't, we don't want to stop, per se, progress, uh, but progress is also green space is part of progress as well. So I, I, do, I do not believe there's enough green space in the project itself. Um, I think we need, to, we need to look at the overall size of the size of the building, and perhaps it needs to be pushed back away from the roads a little bit, and that'll give more green. That'll, give more access to the green space or more possible green space. Um, as far as the bike lanes that go, and I also agree, the, um, the, bicycle, the commuter bicyclists themselves, they, are, they pretty much already know how to bike with cars. They're already allowed to bike with cars, but families don't bike with cars. So I think as far as the biking aspect of this road redesign, Perhaps it makes more sense to have it be favored in the, the family aspect of biking. Um, these, again, the commuters, they already know how to deal with cars. Not that we want them, not that we don't want them to be safer, have their own lane, but they know how to deal with that. So I, I think we need to look at that aspect of it. 
Um, and I am just echoing again the aspect of the, the, amen the amenities. So one thing that's interesting with the projects, the more, the more the project blends with the community to some extent or complements the community, the more the community embraces these types of projects. So as, so as what was stated as far as the amenities within the project itself, if they are as accessible, as reasonably accessible as possible, to the community around it, to the town, I should say, um, it, is more, it is more likely to be embraced. This project will be embraced. Further projects down the road will be embraced if, if the community is really part of it or the amenities within that, the operational hours are part of it. So I'd like to um, just echo that statement that someone had said. And I do understand that you're doing, a, I think you're doing a fantastic job as far as really going towards that gold lead standard, really appreciate that fact, really appreciate it. And with that comes with the lighting aspects as far as after a certain time at night, the shade, you were talking about the, the, the automatic controls as far as the, the shades come down to actually block the light going out to the public. Um, I, don't, I, I truly don't know how the retail aspect of that fits in because I mean, that's going to have a certain operational hour. If you want it to be um, to blend it with the community, then you actually want it to be open for the community to be used after even 7 o'clock or getting on to 8 o'clock at night. The lights need to be on. Um, so I, I, don't see, I don't see that necessarily shutting off at 7 o'clock at night if there's ha something happening with the... I, uh, What's that? Just a point of, point of clarification. The automatic Lutron uh, watch stopper system would not apply to the retail okay. one story along uh, Highland Ave. The uh, dark sky compliant lighting system on the multi-purpose path would uh, certainly be less bright and at a considerably lower height than the street lights that are on many of the streets in Highland Avenue now. So uh, my point is that the Lutron system would not apply to the retail. The retail's uh, roughly five uh, individual retail tenancies, maybe it's eight, uh, maybe it's two, depending upon the type of retailer and restaurant, family style restaurant we're, we're fortunate to attract. And the goal would be for that restaurant to, to basically operate not till 11 or 12 o'clock at night, uh, but likely between the hours of 6 a.m. and uh, 7 or 8 p.m. Uh, maximum hours to be able to provide amenity space to both the office tenants as well as the neighborhood residents and local community leaders, uh, members of the town and meeting. Okay, and, and thank, thank you. And the, the last thing is, again, I appreciate the, uh, what you've been doing. Uh, what you've been doing reaching out to the public is something that we really, we really haven't seen going on in Needham, not to this extent. So I think I, I really commend you on doing that. Um, that being said, um, with, this, with the, all the hearings that are being done and the, and the, the statements being made, you know, the, the community is looking for a project that they can, that they can embrace. But in doing, but in also in doing that, they're also looking, you know, the respect and the trust as far as what's being said, or what we, you know, what will be followed through with. So that's one, that's one thing that's been stated to myself is the public is really looking for um, what is being stated in these hearings to be actually to be a commitment to actually follow through for, follow through on. Now I know that that's a combination of your commitment of what you're going to do or what you've said and what you're going to put in writing, let's put it that way, and also the planning board itself. So the, the public is looking for, if it's being stated, then, it's, then it should also be willing to be put into writing. Accountability. Account, yeah, accountability. Sure, and, and we have stated. no problem. Sure, and, and we would expect that to, to take place. I can tell you from personal experience, uh, Lee and myself have worked together uh, for, I think it's 27, 28 years now, although I, I uh, hate to think the exact time frame. Uh, and I can tell you that Lee is, is very consistent in her uh, preparation of a special permit decision, and that decision will contain uh, many, many, many uh, conditions. Uh, and I would be surprised if she overlooks any of them, especially those that she's heard this evening. In addition to that, uh, we have published uh, four volumes of FAQs, Frequently Asked Questions. It's available on the website dedicated to this project, 557highland.com. You're welcome to peruse it. 
And I can assure you that Lee uh, has looked at it, will continue to look at it, has probably printed each and every volume and reads them consistently. And she will then take those uh, comments and answers and very uh, articulately merge them into her decision that uh, will be reviewed and published by the planning board. And as, as if that is not enough, uh, Lee knows that uh, in the event of any uh, uh, problems with conditions of that decision, she is very good at, at sending uh, letters and uh, making us appear in front of the planning board uh, for further discussion and uh, at times uh, uh, penalty uh, should any uh, decision, should any condition be um, altered in any manner. Uh, including those insofar as uh, transportation of shuttle usage uh, during the pandemic. So uh, we'll, we'll leave it at that. But re rest assured, Bullfinch since 1936 has always followed through on its commitments and uh, will do so here. Uh, thank you. Lee, would you, like to add anything? would you like to add anything, Lee, on that comment? Uh, no, I just, I mean, I appreciate that. And uh, again, the biggest, I think the biggest thing the public would really, would truly want is, I think we need a little bit more space around the building, a little bit more space, a little bit more green space. I think that's what's needed. And it's not a matter of, of giving us an inch, we'll take a mile. I th think it's a matter of that's something that was pushed back way, way back, you know, over a year ago. And I think we just need a little bit more green space. Thank you very much. appreciate it. Thank you, Artie. Um, Thank you. I'm going to, uh, again, Alex, uh, Scroll up through Zoom. I don't see a hand up. Is there anyone else in the room with any other comments or questions at this time? I don't see any on Zoom, Alex. Do you see anything? Did I miss anything? Anyone else? I see no uh, hands up either in the room or on Zoom. Uh, so with that, I'd like to uh, actually, before we take a motion, to continue the hearing. Lee, do you have a time certain for July 7 to continue the hearing? Um, 7, 7.15? And we'll or be- Or 7 o'clock, I'll leave it to you. I can't recall the agenda. And the meeting will be solely, um, I, I would say 7.15, it'll give us time to do a couple things before the hearing begins. I would say start the meeting, the hearing at 7.15, and that meeting will be solely by Zoom. Very good, thank you very much. Can I have a motion to continue this hearing to July 7 at 7.15? So moved. Second. We have a motion by uh, Artie Crocker, a second by uh, Paul Alpert to continue the hearing. Um, <laughs> any discussion? Hearing none, I'll come to the vote. Uh, Paul Alpert. Uh, Artie Crocker? Aye. Natasha Spada? Aye. Jean McKnight? Aye. The chair is aye. We unanimously decided to, um, uh, we've accepted the motion and we have unanimous, unanimously decided to uh, continue the hearing to 7.15 on July the 7th. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tim. Yes. Thank you. Just. Understood. Thank you, thank you very much. Appreciate all your help. And um, we'll, we'll get a summary written up and you know, try and answer as many questions as we can. Yeah.
Excuse me, the meeting is not adjourned. We still have some other items on the agenda, so you can connect with Alex at the office. We'd like to continue with the meeting, please. Thank you very much. Um, at this time, on our agenda, I just see, Lee, that we have additional correspondence. Uh, there was just one piece of correspondence I copied you on um, the insignificant change that I issued on the farmer's market. Um, this was just basically a slight revision in how they were going to set their, te their tents up um, um, at Greensfield um, to take advantage of the town's permanent ins installation of a tent with a cover over it. Right. Thank you very much. I saw that. Does anyone have any comments about that minor modification about the tent on Greensfield for the farmer's market? I've, I've got no problem. Do we have any uh, other correspondence, Lee? No, that was it. At this time, I'd like to entertain a motion to adjourn our hearing, uh, to motion to adjourn our meeting. We have a motion by Artie and a second by Jean McKnight. Any discussion? I, I just have one question for Lee. Lee, have you seen recently on other towns um, a reduction of parking requirement due to hybrid uh, working and and kind of move, moving forward. I'm, I'm just wondering if, if you know the, the parking as as it was as it is in the zoning currently is all based on pre-COVID. I'm wondering if you're seeing any changes with that for reduction of parking requirements. I haven't seen any. I haven't seen any yet. Okay. In terms of in terms of uh, you, you mean in terms of zoning or regulatory changes reflective of that? No, I can check with um, I'll check with Rebecca Brown, who's a consultant that's doing the review on the traffic and the parking, to see what sh um, how she reports on that. She has more um, uh, direct exposure than I do. Okay, thank you. Any other points of discussion? I'll come to the vote. Paul Alpert? Aye. Artie Crocker? Natasha Spada? Aye. Jean McKnight? Aye. The chair is aye. We are adjourned. Thank you very much.